just yeah. in case James. Um, yeah. Just giving a three minute notice, it's 127 and I'll call us to order at 130 sharp. All right, different clocks are saying different times, but my iPhone says 1.30, so I am going to call to order this priority session special, priority setting session, special meeting of the Board of Supervisors on January 17th at 1.30. Uh, let's start with the roll call, please. Perfect. Supervisor Arenas is absent. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian is absent and Vice President Lee present President Ellenberg I'm here and Supervisor Simidian just texted me that he is emerging at the moment at this very moment and noting that Supervisor Simidian is walking to the podium all right Supervisor Chavez would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance please absolutely, absolutely. thank you please stand if you're able I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Item three is public comment, and I want to uh, make a note to any members of the public who have joined us today that we'll be taking public comment on all items on the agenda in addition to general public comment during item three. So if you are planning to speak on public comment, items not on today's agenda, now is the time, as well as for items, any of the items uh, four through, I believe it's 10 on the agenda. Do we have any speakers? We currently have two virtual speakers. We also have some speaker cards that are being brought forward. Okay, let's get a sense of the number so that we can um, allot the time appropriately. And currently we do have three virtual speakers. Okay. And we have one from the public here for item three in person. And the other ones that were just put in, are those? Those are for different items. Those are for different items. We're gonna do all public comment, I just noted, for all items oh. up front. Got that. Okay, so then we have one, two. We have four in person, so and seven in total. And three virtually? Yes. Seven, let's do two minutes, please. Great. Can we set two minutes on the timer? Thank you. Our first speaker will be Linda Edwards. Linda, you will have two minutes to speak and the timer will begin shortly. Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. A warm welcome to our new supervisor, Sylvia Arenas. My name is Linda Edwards. Uh, I'm a Santa Clara County resident for 57 years and a Santa Clara County employee for four years. I live in Bowdoin District 3. Two years ago, the COVID vaccines were introduced and at that time, we didn't have any data showing how effective the shots were. For a year and a half, every time I read Supervisor Chavez's weekly Friday newsletter, the narrative on COVID vaccines was always the same, that they're safe and effective. 
But now that we have the data, it is very clear that the COVID vaccines are not safe and effective. And in fact, that wording has been removed from the COVID ads and replaced with free and widely available. Now that we have the data, we see that the vaccines do not provide immunity, do not stop person to person transmission and come with a variety of possible negative side effects documented in bears, including myocarditis, pericarditis, heart attacks, cardiac arrest, and stroke, to name a few. The data shows that the booster shots are linked to increased shingles and acceleration of cancers. The data also shows that the more COVID shots you get, the more likely you are to get COVID. That's because your immune system is negatively impacted with each shot you get. Any short-term benefit is wiped out within a couple of months, leaving you more susceptible to other illnesses. We now know you cannot vaccinate your way to health and safety. COVID is an endemic seasonal respiratory virus and we'll all get it eventually, more than once, just like the common cold and seasonal flu. We, we can't stop it and we can't hide from it. We have to live with it. I encourage the board and everyone listening to do your own research on COVID shots, independent of the narrative coming from the mainstream media, the FDA, the CDC, and our own public health director. Thank you for your time and attention. And we will be switching to in-person. Our next speaker is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Pardon me one second. Let's start the timer over, please. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, what I'd like to talk about is how COVID did not create a digital divide. What it is, is it highlighted the deficiencies that already existed. So that is, that is the premise of what I'm about to talk about, is that we already knew that we're there. I'm a part of the Chicano community, so we, we know our reality. However, the reality in which the county is saying is true or untrue, you have to catch up to the reality that the Chicano community has experienced over decades, decades, at least the past 80 years. One of the symptoms of that was that digital divide. And so with your, with, uh, when, you, when the county states that it's a resource issue, and that is the premise for the denial of digital access in commission meetings, that's critically important because those commissions advise this board. This board in turn makes decisions that affect the context in which I exist. So this is critically important. And it, it, it should not, to hear that it's a resource issue and there was literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that came to this city with respect to COVID care, what, what, whatever grants and allocations that were given by the federal government in order to alleviate some of the symptoms of what COVID had brought to us, I think we are also tasked as a committee, I mean, as a community, we are also tasked with ameliorating and amending those historical injustices that have been highlighted very clearly as a result of COVID. And one of them is digital access. Thank you. Moving back to virtual. Blair Beekman, you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start once you begin speaking. All right, thank you. Blair Beekman here. It's nice to see Paul Soto in, in, in county chambers. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think what my point is going to be, hold on a second. Close my window here. My point is going to be, uh, yeah, if this is going to be an item today in talking about the future of the hybrid meeting process, um, I can understand certain points of view uh, that want to end the hybrid meeting and return to the regular process uh, as if we're saying, we're saying goodbye to COVID and its ramifications and its effects. Um, but the hybrid meeting process, I think, has brought out something really important for ourselves, how we can have a more open, accessible process of dialogue with community. And you, I, really, I think you really have to be considering those concepts. And it's just simply safer for many people to, to attend hybrid meetings. It's easier, more accessible. 
Um, if you do stop the process now, I really hope you want to start it up again soon. And, and you know, it, it, it just does a lot for the process. You can possibly uh, limit the future of, of, you know, and have specific meetings of FTOC and, and child health and, and elderly care services and, and public safety, possibly, and the Board of Supervisors meetings, and possibly put the commission process on hold for a while. But I, I think in time, you'll just simply see and feel that uh, it's just a better way to work overall. And I think you're only giving into, you know, a very hardline position that uh, by saying no to these things, we're somehow saying no to this beginning of COVID in the first place, which is what we should do. We need to work to not have these sort of COVID epidemics in the future, but I think we really have to respect what the hybrid meeting process accomplishes and work towards, and I hope that will be considered here today. Thank you. And our next speaker is phone number ending in 246. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will begin once you begin speaking. Um, good afternoon, this is Catherine Hedges. I'm a resident and registered voter in District 2 and a person with disabilities. I'm calling about the uh, end of hybrid meetings because that is taking away the voice of people with disabilities who cannot attend meetings in person. Besides issues with people who are immunocompromised not being able to expose themselves to COVID and other respiratory viruses. A lot of people have physical difficulties for attending meetings in person. Either they have transportation problems or they can't sit up in the seat or they have uh, behavior issues or sensory issues. There's a lot of reasons why in-person meetings are inaccessible to a lot of disabled people and also people who um, have to work in the daytime and various other equity lenses. But I think it's especially inappropriate to deny disabled people a voice in the process of policies, such as all the recent discussion around 988 and trust. People with disabilities participate in that process and can give input before the matter comes up on a city council, sorry, um, board of supervisors agenda where there's less opportunity to change the policy. It's better to work on this at the draft stages than the final process, than the final vote. So please do not exclude the disabled community from the public comment process. Um, I, I'm not a lawyer, but this could be an ADA violation. Um, thanks very much. Oh, and also about the COVID vaccines, um, the studies are coming out are showing that the vaccines are safe, but they're less. And it looks like we have one more hand raised. Um, looks like caller Galaxy A13, you will have two minutes to speak. The timer will begin once you begin speaking. And it looks like they've lowered their hands. Oh, they're raising their hands once more. If you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, you should have the ability to speak. You will have two minutes to speak, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Okay, good afternoon. My name is Sharon Luna and I live in the South County and I just want to address uh, of the hybrid uh, for those that are in South County that don't have the ability to attend uh, for the supervisor meetings, planning commission meetings. Um, it has been um, a great opportunity for me and others in the South County to participate in these meetings. And I hope um, that the supervisors will reconsider um, having not only the Board of Supervisors, but the Planning Commission meetings 
And also um, in the San Martin area, we have the San Martin Planning Advisory Committee, which um, county employees, plan the planning department has to come up to our area to attend these meetings. And um, it may not be cost effective for um, those employees to come up um, based on time uh, to South County. So it's important to look at what meetings uh, would be a benefit um, to stay hybrid for cost efficiency. And also, uh, we live in a high tech area. Uh, comments to the board of supervisors, the planning commission, etc. Thank you very much. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Um, if uh, my colleagues don't object, I'm going to ask that we hear items five and six together, seven and eight together, and wrap up with nine and ten. So taking us to item four, um, I'm glad to be able to set the stage for us today. So good afternoon to all of you. Uh, to the clerk of the board's office, thank you for your work administering yet another meeting. To uh, my colleagues, thank you for joining me in what I hope will be a productive and enlightening afternoon. We are all here because the, because the passion for public service drives us. The five of us promise to improve the lives of the nearly two million Santa Clara County residents we serve. Each of us has priorities that drove us to our current role and which we are determined to accomplish. During my first term in office, I observed and participated in the culture of driving change on the issues that matter most to residents. I want us to turn today to the big collective picture of how our county as an organization with its 23,000 plus employees can fulfill the tasks required by state and federal law and set by policy direction. I suspect that most of our employees like us chose this work to better the lives of their neighbors, their families, their friends, and their communities. And most of them work extraordinarily hard to follow the direction of this board. Today, I'm hoping to accomplish three things. First, to level set our understanding of the county's mission, values, and operational priorities. Our range of experience as supervisors is vast. Our most senior member is serving his 22nd year on this board, not consecutively. Nope. Only 14. You had a previous term? Well, he's a, a novice. Interesting. Thank you for that correction. Nonetheless, I think you are still uh, the most senior member, but I appreciate that clarification. Uh, our newest is in her first month. Between them, we have a supervisor halfway through his first term, one beginning her second, and one who has been part of this board for a decade. I got that right, right? And now our job is to work together to build a community operation that supports every one of its residents in the most robust, most sustainable way possible in an environment that allows us to focus our work on the areas with the greatest impact for all our residents. So I'm hoping the first thing we'll do decide together in items five and six is, decide, is to decide together on a near-term set of priorities. Second, with regard to items seven and eight, we will look at the tremendous number of, of board, of, tremendous amount of board directed work that is currently outstanding. We are going to have to reach some agreement on a system of prioritization and how we hold each other accountable as we undoubtedly continue to bring forth worthwhile and important direction. Third, on items uh, nine and 10, will develop a shared understanding of how an equity lens is applied to every challenge we undertake. We'll hear how our county departments are using this critical lens, and I would include racial impacts as well as economic as significant aspects of the equity tool, 
to make decisions regarding the allocation of always limited, never quite sufficient public dollars. And finally, I want to make clear that we are not beginning a true strategic planning process today. That is a significant undertaking that coalesces over time with deep community and broad organizational input. What we're doing today is having a conversation and setting near-term priorities and direction so that each of us, as well as county administration and all our employees, understand where and how our precious and limited resources of time, energy, and funds should be directed. So let's get this going uh, with a presentation first um, relating to a review of the county mission and core values and current policy priorities and operational priorities. Thank you, Madam President. Um, can the clerk put on, there we go. I have a short six slide deck here to show you, um, which goes over the staff's understanding of strategic priorities for the board, both then and now. Um, the mission and the core values of the county are listed here. They were adopted in December of 2009 by the board at that time. Um, I won't read through them, but the focus is on creating a dynamic community with quality services and promoting health, safety, and prosperity for all. Uh, the values are listed. Um, I think you can read them for yourselves. In terms of how the staff works on a day-to-day -day basis to try to implement this, this mission with these values in mind, um, the staff has created seven elements, which we call vision elements, which roughly are um, separated into three areas. One is to focus on customer service as our highest priority. One is to focus on employee wellness and participation. And one is to focus on efficiency and effectiveness. With those in mind, let me switch over to um, County Council James Williams and he'll go through um, the next slide, which is a synopsis of the current board's policy priorities. So on, on this slide, uh, we endeavor to try to encapsulate our best current understanding of the broad categories of policy priorities that have been articulated by the board, either in discussions and conversations at meetings over the last few years, or uh, through the various referrals that individual board members have brought forward over the last few years. These are obviously broad uh, categories and encompass a wide range of things in their breadth. Uh, and later in the conversation, we're hoping that we may uh, get some uh, clarity from the board on any near-term focus areas within these broader categories uh, that the board may wish to identify uh, collectively as some, some areas to focus on over the next couple of years. Uh, but uh, much of what the county does, of course, falls into these broad categories. They're not in any particular priority order, just to be clear, uh, but include expanding behavioral and medical care access and quality, increasing access to housing and addressing uh, the needs of our unhoused community, strengthening community safety and criminal justice reform, efforts, enhancing support for children and families and promoting sustainability. And of course, like I said, a wide range of initiatives that have been taken up by both the board's policy committees um, and the full board in a number of conversations across these categories and as well as really significant focus areas over the last few years budgetarily and uh, in terms of cutting edge policy. I'm gonna turn it over now to Chief Operating Officer Greta Hansen for the next slide. Good afternoon, board members. This next slide was our attempt to capture a little bit of the how we implement those 
uh, key policy areas and the other work of the county and to make sure that um, reflected in these slides were some of those um, ways of doing business that we think are pretty core to the values and priorities of the board as well. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, these are also tied to what are just some of the kind of base mandates that we have to hit as an organization. Um, and, and so uh, a blend here of sort of aspirational goals, policy focuses, but also certain imperatives that we just have to achieve in order for the operation to run appropriately. Um, we wanted to highlight here that equity continues to be a major North Star in every aspect of the work that we do. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit about that in greater depth um, later on today. Um, we know that also our success in serving the community is incredibly closely tied to whether we are an employer of choice, whether our employees have um, what they need, both in terms of resources and then also support to do their best work for the community. Um, we also want to be, as an organization, truly excellent in our delivery of service to be focused on um, really setting the standard for um, government service delivery in all of the areas that we touch. And then we want to ensure that in all the ways that we deliver services to our community that we're creating safe and supportive environments for those clients to receive the services that we're here to deliver. And then critical to all of um, both the policy goals and operational needs of the organization is ensuring fiscal stability and being excellent in our stewardship of the public dollars we use to deliver service and run the organization. Um, of course, critical to that is also legal and regulatory compliance, and there are a lot of um, needs operationally that are really driven by requirements that we're subject to, and those obviously have to be adhered to as we move forward. And then truly critical to our success and efficacy is our ability to partner with community members, community-based organizations, and other levels of government to really ensure that we're delivering the right services in the right way and in a really strategically aligned way with other really critical actors in our community who are also trying to create the, um, the future of this community to look the way we want it to look. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Smith. So uh, we expect today to be mostly a discussion about board priorities, but as you know, we do have the operational priorities that Greta just went through. And we also have departmental priorities, which means that certain each department has their own regulatory requirements and their own uh, operational needs and staffing needs and funding needs. So when we're uh, making up the recommended budget, we start by asking the departments to give us a list of additional resources they may need or cuts that they think would be appropriate depending on what the financial situation is at the time um, in a way that's consistent with board priorities and consistent with operational needs and consistent with all of the um, priorities that have just been mentioned. Um, the departments present those to budget and finance and we analyze them to make sure they're consistent with each other and consistent with board priorities and we make um, decisions about what we're gonna include in the um, recommended budget by looking at all those priorities and balancing the risks and benefits associated with any proposal. Um, during the budget proposal um, process, a um, number of things are put in, a number of issues are put in front of the board for both direction and for action. As the board knows, uh, they discuss the policy issues and policy committees, uh, which give us further ideas of what direction the board would like to take with individual year budget. Um, they also discuss them during hearings and during uh, workshops. 
each year we all know that out of the budget, the entire budget for the county, there's a really relatively small amount of money that's truly discretionary because most of the funding is directed by state and federal regulations and by um, the investments that the county has already made. Of the um, discretionary money that remi remains, which can be in the range of one and a half billion, most of it is not truly discretionary because it's discretionary only in the sense that in order to to spend it, we would have to, on a different project, we'd have to eliminate some projects. So a fair amount of that money goes to the health and hospital system, large amount goes to behavioral health, uh, fair amount goes to social services, a lot goes to the criminal justice system. All of that is considered discretionary, but is not really discretionary. So ultimately, the budget that the staff proposes to the board is a series of compromises consistent with the board priorities as we see them and obviously the board has the authority to either approve that or change it or modify it in any way they want. So that's the process we use and so we're looking forward to uh, further uh, communication from the board today about their priorities and processes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith and Greta and James for, for the presentations. Um, before we, we dive into the item six uh, discussion relating to our near-term focus areas, I wanna see first if my colleagues have any specific questions or clarifications about any of the slides. Seeing one, go ahead, Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. <clears throat> so my question is, in order for us to have the, the following conversation and, and maybe the, you know, the priority, uh, what is it, item seven, the board referrals, um, which was expansive and I, I gotta tip my hat to my colleagues because there's been a lot of work, especially in the last two years. Was it intentional to only reflect the last two years or the last three years of referrals or how, how is that, how was that decision made? I think it's all open referrals. Yeah, the the correct? referral matrix under item seven includes all current pending referrals regardless of date. R regardless of date, okay. Yeah, I, the I ones noticed. that are still pending, yeah. And okay. it doesn't, doesn't include those that have been resolved. If we include those of, that have been resolved, the numbers quite a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. Those are referrals that we've received and completed. Got it, okay. And then um, would we be, uh, the way that the referrals were listed later, um, could, could those referrals fall under um, our mission and core values or the operational um, priorities um, as I saw, just a huge long list and we try to organize it the way that uh, makes sense to us, which is what are our priorities in our, in our uh, office and then, um, uh, and then who, who provided that referral. Um, is there any way that we can, as we continue to have this conversation, because from what I understand, this is just the first step of a, of a, long, a longer process. It hasn't been stated that way, but we're talking about near-term um, goals or priorities, but um, there's also a long-term process that we're going to, um, I'm hoping, draw out from what we learn today. So how can we organize this differently so it falls under um, our values, our, our core values, and then our operational priorities? So uh, I'd, I'd like to answer that. Thank you for, for really excellent questions. Um, to, to the first piece, the, the order that I, um, in which I created the agenda with administration was so that we could really get some um, 
consensus around the priorities um, before we look at the referrals, because part of the, the look back will be what priority areas they, they fall into. So I think you're on the very much the right track, but, but kind of jumped over um, a, a first conversation. Sure. And with regard to long-term strategic planning, that is absolutely something that we need to do, but I'm, I'm thinking about the timing here, because a, a true process, and, and I imagine you've been part of them, um, can be a year or more in, in the making. And um, with two supervisors, you know, very, very frankly, in, in their last two years, I think it's a tough time to begin that process. Um, their involvement would absolutely be invaluable, but they wouldn't be part of the implementation of that plan, and there would be two new supervisors. My, my thought is, is to work toward that, mm -hmm. um, and, in, and in two years, the most senior supervisor will only have been here for six years. So there's a good amount of time mm -hmm. that the, the group of us that comes in 2025 will have to work together to build a strategic um, plan and to move forward in that way. I, I do think it's, it's critical. Um, I think it was more of um, just really thinking realistically through the, the timing of, of where we are uh, right now. And frankly, this would be a, a big step forward even though it is near term. Is that helpful? No, that is very helpful. I think just talking about the process is helpful um, as it wasn't, I can draw my own conclusions <laughs> in terms of how the, why this approach is how it is. Um, and so thank you for clarifying that, but I, I surmise some of that my own self, you know, thinking about why are we starting this way um, and what, what's the intention um, and so I know this is a long, um, long-term uh, process and framework that we're we're going to um, establish. With that, I wonder why um, we don't call out equity um, under our mission and core values. I know that the these were adopted in 2009, um, and so uh, I know that that some of these. Uh, our show in action equity, but we don't necessarily say equity. And so I wonder if that's maybe something that we could talk about as well. Absolutely, and that I think contributes to the, the urgency of, of, um, of reinvigorating and, and freshening what we have now. Can, were any of you here in 2009? Dr. Smith, equity was not named in the mission and values in 2009. Can you speak to that? Um, at that point, uh, I think the board presumed equity was basically the entire reason why counties exist. Um, you know, everything that we do to be a safety net has to do with offering opportunities for those who have been um, underserved in the past or have fewer opportunities than others. Um, I, I can't speak for the board, but obviously now is a time to explicitly mention that. That's why we included it in the operational priorities um, as something that we ask from the departments, and that's why you're going to hear later on about our new equity tool uh, for the budget proposals. But um, that's the best I can come up with. I think they presumed that equity was always on the table. And what we've learned, I think, particularly in the last five years, is that even though equity was in our mind always on the table, in society it wasn't always on the table. Right. So now's the time to correct those words. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Are you good to? Well, it Move would be wonderful to update it somehow. So if, if I, the next iteration of this, or I don't know how uh, this would work, if it's the Board of Supervisors uh, included in that, um, or agendize it for the next meeting uh, so we can take it on more thoughtfully. Let's come back to that at the, at the end of today when we're looking at direction and next steps. 
Are there other, Supervisor Lee, clarifying questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I've, my understanding, uh, uh, having been on board um, now a couple of years, is that we have tons of referrals and a lot of them are just pending and not getting done. As we know, you know, if everything's a priority, then nothing is. So I think part of the reason we're having it today here is try to you know, lay out, look, we've got these pending priorities. How are we gonna get that done with the staff resources we have? That's my understanding why we're here today. Am I correct? Thank you, that is a piece, a piece of, of, of why it, we're right. here okay. today. Yep. Absolutely, you. and clearly everybody is chomping at the bit to get to uh, that next, that next <laughs> item. Right. But I'm gonna do my best to just hold the reins a little bit and, and ask um, if we could put up slide four again. Yes, just one moment. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, you have your, your light on. No, I, I was, um, I, I turned it on after you made that request. I'm happy to wait until you, if you want to. Well, it, no, if, if it's specific questions to um, this and clarifications, okay. absolutely, let's do that first. So um, two, two questions. One is um, from the staff's perspective, where does the, the internal business uh, priorities go? And what I mean by that is, you know, having the technology we need to make the budget more transparent, being able to do dashboards, all where does that go on 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 either slide four or five? What we envisioned was the operational priorities which we listed are the major priorities that we consider when we're talking about keeping the lights on and actually following through on the work that we're doing. Um, next one. Uh, next one. Do you want me to put up? Do you want so meaning to, that next or, next slide. So these are the operational priorities uh -huh. that we ask from staff to be ever concerned about. In terms of the departmental priorities, about you know how much it takes in terms of you know keeping actually keeping the lights on, electricity or following through with current projects or how much um, support is required from TSS or all of those other things. We didn't include all of that because literally that would be thousands of issues. So we focused on looking at the overall picture which we asked all the departments to look to when they're making budget recommendations. So uh, colleagues, one thing I would um, say is that I think at a number of meetings throughout the, throughout the time I've been here, when we've had challenges with asking questions like, you know, if we're adding this many staff, what's the impact going to be to the overall outcomes of the services that are being provided? Some of the reason that we've not been able to achieve some of our goals have been some very basic business operations and I I raise that because I think it's the least interesting part of what we do but it is very very important to um, I think for the boards being able to make decisions and I'll just use one small example we now have um, a, a cash um, report that de that every month tells us or every other month tells us what our cash on hand is and the reason for that is that during the downturn, we had a time where we didn't have cash on hand and the board was a little caught unaware. And I, I probably think the staff was too, in part because the, the systems that we have are so archaic. And so I think one of the challenges that we have is that there are on occasion, and I think when we talk about the equity tool, we'll talk a little bit about that, the the business tools we need to accomplish the the outcomes that we want are not available to us. I'll, I'll use one other example, and this is actually Supervisor Simidian's um, knitting, so to speak, um, and that is around how we maintain facilities, buildings, and we, when I got here, we did not have a single location where we could look at all of the properties that the county owned, leased, or operated. And so now we do, but that took years. I mean, part of the reason we were so focused on the technology around our um, contracts is we did not have a place you could call up 
and look at all of our contracts for a single vendor. So I, I raise that because I, I think as we see this transition in, in um, uh, leadership that the board is gonna have to think very seriously about that which is least sexy, but I think when we get to the, to the other um, issues around the um, referrals, I, I, I have a suspicion that some of the reason we get continued referrals on, the, on similar topics is that there's an effort to try to get our arms around a particular challenge and some of that is inhibited by our ability to do that. So I would just say as it relates to operational priorities that certainly the business of the organization has to be an operational priority and, and even from a, a budgetary perspective, we, that's something that I think the board needs to hold itself accountable for because I think it puts a lot of pressure on the staff to have to make choices on TSS projects as an example. TSS, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's one issue that I was a little surprised not to see on here. And then the other that I, I'm curious about, and this actually goes under the partnering with community members. We, um, as a county, oh, that's right. Sorry, I couldn't resist. The, the jail management system. <laughs> Yikes. So, yes. I mean, so, I, and, and, and it's caused a lot of conflict. I, I guess my point is, is that I, 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 again, and I'm not putting this on the staff, I'm really saying that that ought to be a core principle for the county that the county actually um, can function. And I think that's a really good example of, of it not functioning. I mean, I really could go on now that's popping into my head. But on another on another matter, and this has to do with the partnership with community members and community-based organizations and other levels of government, what's missing in this um, that I think the, that, uh, Dr. Smith, you've really been trying to remedy, and that is um, our communication systems overall, our public information. We have PIOs spread across the county, some speak multiple languages, some speak only English. They're like the SOPs of how we communicate with the public are really very inconsistent. And I think, um, I know that uh, Dr. Smith, you've reprioritized that by, by putting more resources in that um, within your office. It's been a concern of mine, for example, that we don't market VMC to the broad public. I mean, we're working on all of that, it's in process, but I think that that our ability, um, one of the things I learned during COVID is that our ability to bring all of those resources together was so critical. And, and I'm concerned that if, again, if we don't call that out, it means we don't invest in it and it stays very fragmented. And again, I think that's a core um, business function of the organization. And again, I'm not sure the right way colleagues to call that out, but there's a lot that, again, when we get to the, this other part of the agenda that we're gonna to have to talk about that I think we keep hitting um, a brick wall because there's a business problem, not a will, not a values, not a anything else, but an actual business problem. So um, colleagues, I personally would like to see what, as we move forward that that come be part of whatever discussions move forward. Um, and uh, Supervisor Allenberg, I know you're, you're really trying to shape this for all of us and I really appreciate that. So those two, and it, elements I think are really critical and I think because transparency uh, and this goes back to our hybrid meetings if transparency is a core value of this institution it is reflected in many many ways and all of the examples I gave you about our ability to call up contracts collectively our ability to know what properties we own that at the root of that is a transparency a fundamental, how transparent are we even within the organization? Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Chavez, for, for all of that. Um, and to be clear, I, I'm not trying to shape this. I'm trying to make sure that we all shape this together. Um, and I am taking notes. And I, I wonder, um, Greta, as our still relatively new Chief Operating Officer, if you wanna speak to the points that Supervisor um, you know, the excellent points that Supervisor Chavez uh, made and how you might be looking at the business of the organization. Just briefly, I realize that that's, I'm sure, a massive topic. Sure, I mean, I, I absolutely think um, some of the points you hit on exactly as you said are real business challenges and there isn't a values misalignment in terms of the, the desire and, um, and goals, but 
but also some, some real challenges. I think JMS, just the jail management system as an example of where we've had extraordinary challenges getting a vendor to deliver the services that we need to be compliant. One thing I'll just say about the current operational priorities, a challenge we had in kind of putting together these slides is figuring out how to bucket different, different things. And so I would say using, picking up that example, um, you know, the, the need for an effective, appropriate jail management system would fall under maintaining legal and regulatory compliance, would also fall under champion excellence and effectiveness. But I take your point, which is there are certain things that are very high priorities that may be worth being much more explicit about as core operational priorities, as opposed to things that can kind of get um, lost in what is a, a list of very, very 30,000 foot um, categories, and so I would say, you know, I, I sort of leave it to all of you to, to think about how best to use this time, but I definitely think that there's a shared um, sense of urgency around the couple of categories that you named being having the technology systems that allow us to better understand our outcomes, having really robust communication systems, and including communicating with the community about the services that we provide, um, and then also making sure that we're getting over the finish line, some of these really mission critical operational system tasks like implementing an effective JMS near term as quickly as we can. Susan, I, I think, um, so Greta, that is very helpful. And, I, and one thing I would just say is that there, there may be other, um, at the end of this discussion, other issues that pop up. But what I, what I would say is that The, the list of um, issues that fall into this category are so broad. I mean, there's so many and they're so, um, it's so deep across the organization. Behavioral health is an example. Like um, when we talk again about our priorities, behavioral health, we have really, we can't say, I mean, we're getting there, but we couldn't for many years say, how many beds are available tonight? And how do we get someone in them? So I. I just would really say um, to my colleagues, I, I do think that the business of we are a we are a business in many many ways. The healthcare system it is a business, and and frankly, Dr. Smith, one of the most amazing things that he did when he got here was really working with the hospital on their budget, which is the business side of what they do, and the billing, like our ability to improve the billing in the hospitals is going to alleviate the general fund, which will allow the board more discretionary resources to deal with behavioral health, housing, or homelessness, whatever that is. But those are, so for me, I, I do think that procurement and and all of those other, um, our, our budget management systems, that, that if, if we don't call that out, we are losing so much we're losing resources to the county. I mean, it's dramatic. So I appreciate the point that you raised, Greta, about how um, how you see that integrated in. My fear is that when it gets dealt with is only when there is significant need or conflict or trauma to the institution. And that, I think, is, an, is not a good way to keep doing business. And as a matter of fact, a number of the issues, we had conflict here over them uh, because they're not... They're not raised, and I don't know if that, I don't know what that means for you all as you think about the future, but it's too big an institution anymore to have it be, have those actions be embedded, I think. And so, you know, you you will give us your wisdom in terms of how to address that, but I, I think that is going to be a significant challenge. And even as it relates to how the budget is prepared, a number of the issues that I've recommended over the years we can't do because we don't have the the infrastructure to do it so I again I you know anyway it's just something I've thought a lot about I don't have a solution but really want to see it highlighted in the way you're all approaching our work can I comment on that please um, Supervisor, you're right, and it's always a balancing act because literally there are thousands and thousands of issues that you're referring to. Um, and in a county which was much more conservative, say like 
um, San Diego or Kern County, they would spend a huge amount of their money right. on maintenance, facilities, um, IT projects, many of the things that you're talking about which make business easier. I mean, for example, the story I always tell is when I came here 13 years ago, in the heart of the Silicon Valley, there were 22 different email systems that existed in the county, <laughs> none of which communicated with each other. When I asked the ISD director, which is what we called it at that point, to give me the group email to send an email to everybody, they said it didn't exist. And there were names on the, on the uh, central database for each of those 22 uh, emails that were of people who had long since departed the county and sometimes departed the earth. Um, so we're always in a balance trying to do enough to keep us going structurally and operationally and also that need means that we have some left to address the board's priorities. Um, in those other counties like San Diego, Kern, they really don't do all of the progressive things that this board wants. So, you know, it is a challenge. Like you saw before when we looked at the capital improvement program, which was just some of our physical structure improvement needs, it adds up to well over two and a half billion dollars. If you include all of the maintenance, it would be twice that. That doesn't include the IT needs and all of the personnel needs. So you're absolutely correct and that's why it's always a balance and that's why we're always asking the board to give us direction about which way you want to go. And I, you know, Jeff, I, I think that's a really good point. And one of the things that I think most people don't know about Santa Clara County is that for generations we have spent more on behavioral health, like we've used more of our discretionary funds to build out our behavioral health programming than I don't know of another county that has done that to this degree. And so I think- Percentage wise, I, we're highest. Yeah, and, and so I think that that's a really excellent example. And I think the, the board made some really thoughtful choices even before you know I got here. And I think, Joe, that was actually part of the the um, first time that, that you served on the board, that you all made those good decisions. I think, though, that an example of what where I think that if we could align our outcomes a little more to the, again, to the business of the organization, when the hospital was expanding into Epic and us not adding it to the jail system at that time had an extra cost for us when we did do it. And there were some reasons I know that that decision was made at the time, but I think what Susan, what you're trying to get us to in terms of this long-term planning actually creates opportunities for us to be, um, to, to be fiscally strategic into the future in a way that we, that we haven't been. And Epic is a really good example. We needed Epic in the jails. I mean, as all of the work that we're talking about right now, we've wanted that, that, that I was surprised actually it was a tour I took when I first got here and I was asking how were we communicating with anyway, and we weren't. So, um, so yes, I think those are all really important issues that the board will have to wrestle with. So thank you. Thank you so much. The uh, observation that I'm pulling from this really insightful exchange is how intertwined uh, operational priorities and policy uh, priorities are. I think, um, you know, they're, they're set up on on separate slides, and I understand why, but I, I think that you have crystallized really quite brilliantly how interrelated um, they are and how much efficiency in the operational dollars, with the operational dollars and systems allows us to move so much farther forward in our, in our service uh, and programs to community. So thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do, Melissa, could you, go, Cynthia, sorry, can you go back to slide four? Just yes, actually, back. that's Dr. Smith's presentation. Oh, so. Dr. Smith, can you hop back one slide? Can someone magically make slide four up here? Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so I think with that, and I, 
um, I, I would like your reflections on, this is administration's interpretation based on our referrals, based on our, our conversations in committees at the board level and one-on-ones, -on -one, one -on that these are the board priorities. Are they, so two questions. First, is this an accurate list? Are there things that are missing or things that don't need to be on here? And two, within these very broad categories, are there uh, narrower, again, shorter term goals over the next few years that, that you imagine that there is broad consensus um, among, among all of us to focus energy um, significantly there? And when I say energy, I'm really kind of thinking about our current and incoming um, CEO, because ultimately we're directing where they should spend the bulk of their uh, time and energy and, and staff direction. Supervisor Smidian, were you putting your light on or just waving a pencil? I was. On the one hand. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> we're all ready for it. <laughs> Actually, I have, a, I have a question about one of the board policy priorities um, uh, and, and we'll indirectly invoke a second if I may to direct through the chair to our county executive, Dr. Smith. <clears throat> and I asked the question in, in part because it will help me think through the rest of the conversation that you've teed up today, Madam Chair. Uh, if I remember correctly, Dr. Smith, there's a provision of the Welfare and Institutions Code or some state statute that specifically calls out the obligation of counties to provide health care for the indigent in the state. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, uh, section 17,000. Of the Welfare and Institutions Code? Okay. Nice. Uh, well, I just, <laughs> now you're just showing off. No, I, I was gonna say, I, I didn't, I, if I'd known the code section, I might have been feeling Proud, but uh, on this, I, I, as I say, it was big. But I'm not remembering, it, it's, I had this conversation, Madam Chair and colleagues, recently with some, some folks in the world of city government who suggested that, well, addressing homelessness is the county's responsibility. And I said, well, you know, actually, it, it, part of the challenge in addressing homelessness, as I understand it, is that it's not really anybody's responsibility under state law in the clear and well-defined way that um, health care for the indigent is. And my, and Dr. Smith, please feel free to correct, clarify, whatever, but I mean, now I'll do the on the one hand. So, on, I mean, <laughs> on the one hand, we have a housing authority. They're supposed to, you know, be in the business of affordable housing in a way that is, very clear and direct and established by law. On the other hand, we have cities who are responsible for land use approvals and entitlements, including residential and commercial development, which commercial development creates jobs, which creates demand for housing. So we're right back in the whose responsibility it is. And then as I think through, and this is my, and I wanna be really respectful about this, this is just my interpretation of the conversations we had as a board, what I, what I intuited, heard, thought I heard, uh, and what I felt myself, which was, you know, if, if the folks who are unsheltered, who are homeless, are more often than not gonna be our county clients in any one of a number of different venues, then doesn't it behoove us to step up on the housing front even if we think that that's not, quote, technically our responsibility. Dr. Smith, uh, you know, any insights you might have on this because it, it does sort of uh, play into how we, how we make these judgments, Madam Chair, about what our priorities are, should be, have to be under state law, I mean, you know, under, Welfare and Institutions Code section. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's our legal responsibility, as I understand it. Uh, the housing uh, 
work we do, we came to in a very big way, but for a somewhat different, by a somewhat different path, I guess. Dr. Smith, if I may, through the chair. Um, start with the uh, Welfare and Institutions Code. It's true that counties have the responsibility to provide medical care or services for the indigent, but it's a very old code and indigent was never really defined. So each county takes its own shot at deciding what that means. So for example, San Diego County, very rich county, doesn't have a county health system. It contracts with um, hospitals to provide care for the medically indigent at very low rates. Um, we in this county, you know, were very forward thinking and decided a long time ago to keep the county delivery system and to expand it. Um, by definition, we do more than we're required by state law. However, the board over many years has felt that that was an imperative and I must say I totally agree. Uh, with regard to housing, um, there has been an evolution of the responsibility um, and I think it's fair to say that you currently see lots of levels of government and private sector working at it from different perspectives. Um, the federal approach to homelessness used to be um, through housing authorities and public housing. Um, cities were supposed to be building affordable housing for a long time, but most cities had to be forced to do that. Some of them then created uh, what we now call ghetto areas where they would, through various um, legal requirements, focus cer certain populations that had to live in certain areas because they couldn't get a loan in other areas or they had social restrictions or legal restrictions that prevented them from moving to other areas. And then counties were never really technically obliged to, to deal with homelessness. However, as we all know, virtually all of the chronically homeless have chronic mental illness or other social issues that are our responsibility, A-R-E-O-U-R. -E um, so at this point, I think it's a multifactorial problem and the latest initiative at the state level, which will make homelessness even more of a uh, county responsibility is that Cal-AIM is changing all of Medi-Cal so that Medi-Cal recipients will now have um, have to have some access to housing and other services that will hopefully prevent homelessness. So um, I think the state's goal is to make counties responsible. Through the chair, if I may, with a follow-up that takes, in, as I'm turning all this around in my head, it takes me then to the, to the issue of social services broadly defined because what I hear from many of the smaller cities in particular is <clears throat> when someone says, well, couldn't you provide this set of services or that set of services in the social services arena? They say, well, that's clearly not a city responsibility. It's a county responsibility. And again, my, my own view has been you know, that that's a shared responsibility and, and, and frankly should be a shared responsibility with um, all of us sort of figuring out how we can partner with one another to deliver more. But do you have a take on, on that? <laughs> um, well, yes, I think that, um, you know, more and more we're realizing that there are other social determinants of health and wellness as well as society wellness and uh, access to services. How cities are laid out, what their land use decisions are, have a great impact on the social services needs and health needs. So I think ultimately it is a team effort which requires 
responsibility on the city side as well as the social, I mean, as well as the county side. I don't think small cities are gonna get away with saying that's a county problem. I would look forward, Madam Chair, to hearing what other colleagues, what colleagues think about that social services array. Just, it would be helpful to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I, I think that you raise a really excellent point. And one thing um, that I have been thinking a lot about is that, you know, when we decided to get into the housing business, very wise people here said, if you do that, we're going to be blamed for homelessness. And, um, and we all knew that, that tr true or not, that it was somebody had to lean in and play a leadership role on, on addressing this issue, and, and we certainly stepped up. One, one thing that I think might be advisable is for us, uh, as we're going through this process, is to really more clearly define the, um, the partners that are responsible for addressing these issues. And you know, when I was, when I was listening to you, I was looking at the, the one around strengthening community safety and reform criminal justice. And what it reminded me is that um, the, the partners there really are the police departments throughout the, the county, the county sheriff's office. And as an example, um, one, of the, one of the challenges that we've had in particular with the city of San Jose besides, um, and it hasn't been with the city, I'm sorry, it was really with a couple of members of the council, which was this focus on you know, the county having a catch and release policy language they used, I think it's offensive, but I'm gonna put it out there. And, and to note that over the time that they were concerned about um, really what is state law, um, they as a city had, had uh, city of San Jose in particular, had not increased the number of arrests over that same period of time. So they have been arresting the same number of people 10 years ago as they are today. And that will have an impact on on all kinds of things. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. They don't have enough staff and all, all of that. But to to not be, I mean, I think this is an opportunity as we look at our policy priorities to really be discreet about what role, what, what we're holding ourselves accountable for and then what, what are we holding our partners accountable for because I think it will take it out of the finger pointing and far more into the do we have agreement around this? And as an example, social services that Supervisor submitting that you raised that I think is a really important point is that a number of our cities use their CDGB money to provide social services, and that is for senior services as an example, senior nutrition. And so I think we've never really challenged ourselves or our partners to be more um, accountable to each other, which I think would mean that we would spend public dollars much better um, so I appreciate that you raised that because I think as part of any of our policy priorities, our partnerships and who, who we think are the top two, three, or four partners really need to be uh, laid out because I think that will help us both in terms of decision making but also prioritizing because they are in the social services business. Every single city is, whether they like it or not, and they're in the nutrition business and they're in the therapeutic services businesses, a number of them. So I think that's an excellent point. James, you had your, your light on. Did you give up on us? Oh, I had a couple comments picking up on uh, Supervisor Simidian's questions to the county executive from earlier, but if Please. you want me to go, right go on, can, I, I was just going to comment a little bit on kind of the concept of what's, you know, what's the county's legal responsibility and kind of how are counties um, conceived of by the state, right, under our structure here in California. And, you know, counties in a lot of ways, right, we're subdivisions of the state. And so if you think about kind of how a lot of our work is structured and organized, so much of it is in the delivery of what in other states are actually state-delivered, state-run programs. That includes a lot of the social services system. Uh, but in California, because of how big California is, California has organized that kind of at the county level. And because of how the funding streams work and, um, and because of that structure, there's so much more interrelationship and so much more regulation and direction from the state to counties than, for example, the relationship between the state and cities, um, which is just very, very different structurally uh, because of that. And so I think that that really comes to play 
when you look at these items and you think about the difference between the role that the county may have in uh, behavioral and medical care, for instance, right, which is so significantly intertwined, inextricably intertwined, right, with uh, relationships with the federal and state government and how those programs are organized and funded and delivered. Um, similarly, in the area of criminal justice, right, where the county has so many specific, but, but different, because there's different county actors, the sheriff, the district attorney, probation, uh, but also other actors like the courts and police departments, as Supervisor Chavez mentioned, but some very, very specific kind of structural things that are county responsibilities. And those, I think, stand in contrast to the, to the more amorphous nature of county core responsibilities when you look at the other categories here related to the work that we do with respect to our unhoused community, although as the county executive mentioned, there's now increasing state level, you know, connection with what's happening with, um, with the reforms related to Cal AIM, but also in terms of support for children and family sustainability, those kind of categories where it's really a question of, um, you know, how does it impact the clients that the county otherwise serves or um, what kind of additional work are we doing in partnership with other local governments as a responsible steward and as an entity that really has an overall responsibility to take care of the residents uh, in our community. So I just, in my mind, there's just those layers and that I think comes out a little bit in the, um, some of the operational priorities around, you know, we have legal compliance, regulatory compliance, but we have all these state mandates, right, in those areas that don't quite exist in the same way, or at least are far less significant in some of the other areas. Uh, and that does drive a lot of, not just the budgeting, but a, a lot of how the programs themselves are delivered. Thank you. Um, would I oh, just make a, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, I apologize, go ahead. I'm just um, really trying to, to process and, and, and synthesize um, what everyone is, is saying. I think that you know, defining partners uh, in the responsibility is a critical piece. I think a place where our county has done an extraordinary job um, is in the community plan to end homelessness. And no, we haven't ended homelessness. Uh, yet, but we have, as was noted earlier, invested significantly. Counties around the state are looking at our community plan uh, as a model. Uh, there is no statewide vision, unfortunately, for ending homelessness, so there is endless finger pointing, particularly between cities and counties, but other, other entities as well. That allegedly is in process. We certainly shouldn't sit around and wait for it. Uh, but, but I couldn't agree more that this collectivity is the way to, to address our biggest challenges. I'm gonna, just in the interest of um, finishing up at the, at the time we said we would and getting through a number of important issues, I wanna bring us back to this list and uh, maybe I'll give a couple of examples. Um, I, certainly I, I would agree that expanding behavioral and mental, mental health care access and quality is, is, a, is a top priority. In terms of short-term goals, our behavioral health uh, folks have told us that they need 500 beds in, at X different levels by a particular date. Um, that, I would say, is, is an example of an area, in my view, as one, one supervisor, that we should be absolutely prioritizing um, resources, attention, accountability, um, measuring progress uh, toward those goals, um, and having something specific to show in the near term again to say, we focused on this and look what has been accomplished, look what is now available to the community uh, that, that wasn't before. So that, that's an example of kind of what I'm what I am thinking about and just come to come back to the list um, and Supervisor Sumini and I really um, appreciate it and I'm intrigued by the, the way that you approached it. Um, I wonder just to get confirmation from everyone or not, is this the right list? Is there something missing? 
are any of these elements not, in, in your estimation, not reflective of a board priority such that we should say, we're gonna hang back on this. And as I say that, I'm hearing Supervisor Chavez say, everything all at once, we're not hanging back ever on anything. <laughs> we're all in each other's heads. And now, thank you for your intelligence, Supervisor Arendis. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think we're, I'm gonna go back to my uh, first point, which is equity. And I know that these uh, priorities are going to accomplish equity for our, our vulnerable uh, communities in different places of our county. Um, but I think it's very important for us to, um, one, have a shared understanding of what equity is, and we all have the GARE definition of it, and then we can adopt it, or we've had pledges that uh, uh, Supervisor Chavez has led in the past and that the, uh, the, the city has uh, duplicated and in, in, um, in the spirit of, of making sure that our systems work together, that we've taken that same pledge, right? <clears throat> and as, as the discussion was evolving, I was thinking about the work that we're doing, that we were doing as chair of uh, neighborhood services and education uh, together, um, Supervisor Chavez, and what um, I know that we were hoping to create is this paradigm shift around who's responsible for our communities, and we are all responsible at all levels of government. Um, and I know from uh, the city side of it, uh, you know, we led, um, and this is one of the things that I'm really sad that I left behind, but our child and youth master plan has that goal in mind um, to have a system of care for our youth and for our children that is driven by um, the Bill of Rights and not necessarily what services we provide or we provided at the city, but what uh, do our children deserve and have a right, uh, right to, and then making sure that we have a partnership that actually um, has that comprehensive system of care. And so making sure that we work across all levels of, of, of uh, government and um, nonprofits and whatnot. And so this is a really good conversation. Um, I'm glad we're having it. And I want to make sure that we uh, continue to have equity at the forefront um, and that we think about how do we operationalize um, equity? How do we have a shared understanding so that when our systems of uh, uh, interact with one another, they're seamless, right? Because we're all speaking the same language, uh, relatively, right? Relatively the same language, um, hopefully based on what the GARE definition is and maybe uh, changing it just slightly. Um, so I think for me, what's missing here is um, how do we integrate um, an uh, equity lens and institutionalize that in our policies? Um, because I know that each uh, of these different areas are going to accomplish some level of equity, um, but how are we doing this based on race and equity? So what I'm hearing is that we need to move through so that we can get to talking about the referral matrix and talking about the equity tool to answer all of that. I, I think, I think, um, what I'm trying, but but it may be artificial, and I and I think that's um, that's creating a, a little bit of good energy and tension. Is that I thought we could do this all linearly, but you're absolutely right that they're all connected and iterative. So what I'd like to propose um, and and is, a priority and it should be stated as a priority. Absolutely right, um, not just understood. Uh, I agree. Oh. 120%. Awesome. What I'm going to do in order to keep us moving and get to be able to talk about all of the things is in the absence of anyone telling me otherwise, I'm going to conclude that this list of five does reflect this board's priorities. I haven't heard anybody say that there's something missing or something shouldn't be here. So Chair, topic. that is exactly what I'm saying is missing, is the equity, the integration of equity right, and the right, standardization. Right. So I, I'm not sure that you capture that in the way that you were summarizing. Oh, um, 
That's fair. I think what I was trying to do was put a little bow on this piece oh, of the conversation and then add. so that we can go forward, hit the other topics that you're talking about, and then end with something somewhat coherent. And, and add a number six to this that is equity focused. Uh, well, I, I think what I heard you say is that equity needs to be embedded in all of these. Well, I, there, I think in the same way that Supervisor Travis was talking about how um, some of the priorities that you've all been talking about in the past uh, can't, come, come, can't come to fruition because there's a business mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of it that just impedes that implementation. It's the same way with the equity lens. If we're not all talking about um, and thinking about equity in the same way and, in, and collecting data, the right kind of data um, based on race or based on mm -hmm. um, our definition of what we feel is equity uh, for our communities, um, then how can we take on some of these uh, other areas? I, I think we need to also have this implementation, the business side, if you will, of equity, which is uh, to make sure that we have an analysis of, of what is the right type of data to collect. Is everybody collecting the same standardized data? Do we have, through legislative uh, files, um, an analysis or an interpretation of what equity is and that impact in in any of the, the, the items that we're receiving or the referrals that we're providing. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't see it institutionalized is what I'm Got saying. It. So I want to make sure that it's somehow it's captured and it's part of the business side, if you will, of, of the pol of board policy priorities. But I hope that my colleagues you know, can voice and hopefully agree or, or not, and then we can have a discussion around that. But thank you for that clarification and I, and I will um, attempt, and, unless uh, another colleague wants to do it, to offer a motion at the at the very end with um, some direction about updating um, as needed here. And and Supervisor Arenas, absolutely, we will um, we will add specifically, explicitly, um, the equity consideration and policy. We'll ask administration to think about how they build in. Um, the business of the county as well. Does that work? And, and we can, we can, um, you know, really crystallize it bef before we wrap up today. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, I, I, I think um, I was just going to um, reiterate. I, I think what um, Supervisor Arenas is asking for is is the appropriate request and it is appropriate that it be in a policy priority because I, I do think that even with the work that you both did on mental health, you're, you were really focused on, um, on, on the equity component of that. I know that Senator Cortezi and I worked on it, that before you all got here and it really hasn't um, been embedded the way that I think we're all kind of asking, which, um, I'll, which I'll go back when we talk about the number of referrals. I think part of the reason there are so many of them is that we're not, when we don't see the response, we go back at it a different right. way and and then, you know, so I, I, we can talk more about that. I do want to say that I think um, the that backbone of how we operate uh, this business component, whether it's on our current operational priorities or on the board policy priorities, and I, I really want to get feedback from staff on that. I want to make sure it's included. The other issue I, I just want to pull out is the issue around um, transparency, which I think about that relative to the improvements we want to continue to see with the registrar of voters and the outreach there, the hybrid meetings, you know, how, how we do our business matters a great deal. And the other, and I think that may actually go into our community partnership. And the reason I was raising the issues around communication and those is that it isn't to say that I don't think these are, are um, the board priorities, but I, I those other three issues that I raised and the issue that Supervisor Arenas raises mm -hmm. are really important to both sheet four and five and may, you know, may change for the board as we go through the discussion today. So I understand the point you raised about coming back, but I, I do want to just call those out. Equity communications business. Right, and, okay. um, and this idea of really the, 
embedding our partnerships in any of the work that we're doing. I, th I think that is, a, again, a, f a fundamental change that we need to make. And, and by the way, as the, on the um, hate crimes task force, on the human trafficking task force, all of those, anytime there's a recommendation that comes to this board, there are recommendations that go out to everybody else who's supposed to be responsible for some piece of it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, with your, oh, Supervisor Lee, then I'm going to move on to item seven. Please. Sure, yeah, exactly. I, I think uh, I echo the same uh, comments that's been uh, given my colleagues. Uh, I think the, the uh, bringing up the policy priorities with the equity uh, in mind of, of, of lifting it from the operational side to the higher top, I think that's, that's basically what, what we are uh, moving forward, which makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, going back to a separate issue that was mentioned earlier with the shared responsibility uh, of counties and cities, um, no names mentioned, but I have worked uh, very hard on, on, on house issues with another city, and there was actually a comment coming from a very senior uh, individual of the city, basically says, well, you know, this unhoused business is really a county responsibility. And I think a lot of us at the call, at the Zoom call, was really like speechless uh, to have a city official uh, missing that point. Uh, and I think this engagement of the shared responsibility is so important for us to try to tackle this. And we have 15 towns and cities in this county, not just San Jose, San Jose is doing a very good job, by the way. But in addition to that, there's so many other towns and cities that we as a county really need to engage and educate them to let them know that, hey, this is not just our issue, this is our shared issue, then we gotta work together to solve this. And, and, and with that in mind, going back to uh, President, your earlier point about measurement and accountability, right, holding us accountable, Hey, we, we, we talked about increasing number of mental health beds by this date. We talked about increasing number of detox beds by this date. Uh, how about even discussing the number of interim housing units? Is that something that we should even consider uh, as, a, as a priority issue? Or how about number of temporary beds that we need? So I just want to just raise those issues and something to talk about. We talk a lot about permits of affordable housing and, and, and units there, but I'm, I'm bringing that up too as well. So we're gonna talk about shared responsibility a goal and meeting these things, you know, when we have so many people in the house, are these some priorities that we need to lay out so that staff could see what where the board is going and then we're going to it this goal of accomplishing this in a measurable and accountable and transparent way. So I just want to raise that. <laughs> I lost that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that is really insightful, Supervisor Lee, and maybe part of what um, you know, we'll ask for as this is updated and, and enriched is kind of a categorization under each topic of what, what work is being done right now, what's expected to be accomplished over the next couple of years, what are the metrics, how do we measure it as it's going, not creating new additional work, just organizing and making very transparent for all of us. Dr. Smith has the last word, and then we're moving on to item seven. I just wanted to um, make sure I heard correctly earlier in the conversation, the board was talking about modifying the core values to include equity as a core value. Would that be something the board wanted us to come back with? Um, and that sort of sets the stage for all of the inclusion of equity in everything that we're doing? I think you did hear that. Okay, good. But we'll, we'll, we'll make it clear at the end. James, are you leaning in? For the next item. Excellent, all right. <laughs> we are moving to, I, I'm, I'm so torn because I love the conversation. I have so much respect for all four of my, my colleagues. This is, um, you know, in some ways, just an indulgence to get to have this kind of conversation. Uh, and yet I'm also tasked with keeping us on time, moving, moving ahead and being productive. So with that, item seven is to receive a report regarding, regarding board referrals. James Williams, thank you. And I'll be kicking off the presentation on this item. And I'm just gonna pull this up hopefully folks can can see this do i need to zoom in okay. 
So first, I just want to thank uh, Megan Doyle, who's here with us as well for this item, and Sean Whiteman and Brian Darrow and others who helped put this together. And Sean, I think, took the lead on really doing this analysis, with which I want to walk through just for a few minutes, because actually, there was a lot in here that surprised me. Um, and that I think uh, can help inform the next conversation around um, kind of prioritization and the, the referral process. Um, I did want to just take a couple minutes to, to talk about what we've seen in the last handful of years with respect to board referrals. And, um, and there's some description in, in the brief memo around the methodology here for the analysis, but I think you know, regardless of the very specifics, uh, this, you know, the same approach was used looking at all of these different years. And I think the trend line is really clear. Um, and that is that if, you, if the board looks back to 2010 through today, there's been an eightfold increase in the total number of board referrals and requests just at board meetings, to be clear. This doesn't include committees or several other categories as described in the memo. Uh, to a total of 941. And obviously there are not 941 items on the referral matrix uh, because that referral matrix that's attached reflects those items that are still outstanding. So there were many, many, many items, of course, responded to over the course uh, of the year and prior years. Looking at the, the next table, which is kind of the number of referrals and requests per board meeting, also similar increase from about a little over four to over 32 per meeting. Again, just looking at items from board meetings themselves. The, the most interesting thing to me was actually this third table, which is where the requests have been coming from. Uh, most of them, 735 last calendar year, were requests during items that were discussed, not agendized formal referrals that were put separately on the agenda, although those have increased as well. Those are the orange uh, category. Um, and then also items that have come up during the consent calendar. 76% um, of the total are those blue category items that were verbal requests during discussed items. Um, and then, as you can see, a pretty significant number of verbal requests for items that are on the consent calendar that have not been pulled. The, I think the top line from, from our perspective, both county council and administration on this, is that this is obviously a very, very significant number of items. Um, and that the items and kind of how they're organized right now really drives a lot of utilization of key leadership time in the organization. Um, there's a relationship between kind of the volume of items and, and the level of depth and responsiveness, I think, to, that the board has gotten in return on some of these. Um, and what we're respectfully hoping from the board is that there may be some conversation around kind of what the board feels like makes the most sense here in terms of how to best handle this, um, and if there are some strategies that might help uh, make the management of the referral process and the responsiveness uh, more satisfactory for everyone involved, because obviously there's lots of very, very important items being brought forward through these requests for information as well as policy initiatives that are being put forward. We have put out there four ideas of some specific things that we think may help manage this process a little better for the board's consideration. Um, one is to actually remove items from consent if there are questions or requests related to the items. That was absolutely the practice historically uh, and then has really shifted in the last handful of years. Uh, but that gives an opportunity for uh, staff to get some clarification on what those requests are to potentially, if it's a simpler question, actually have it handled uh, at that time instead of generating a separate report that needs to come back either off agenda or on agenda. Um, and 
provides kind of a, a process that we believe would allow that, at least that yellow category to be dealt with more effectively. Our other specific concrete suggestions are to uh, ask significant questions in advance, which would allow us to alert the relevant staff to help be present to help answer at least some of those more informational questions that are being posed on some items uh, that may help reduce some of the need for follow-up off agenda memos or follow-up items uh, for uh, administration to be given an opportunity to engage in conversation around the timeline for response on items. Uh, some of these items generate, um, because of the timeline that's been provided, an initial response, but then really there's a lot of subsequent work that needs to be done. Um, and so the items then stay active for a considerable amount of time, um, but there hasn't been the opportunity to to have a conversation around what timeline might make the most sense for the item at the outset. Uh, and then with respect to that category of items that are the written referrals that are agendized separately, an opportunity for administration and county council to uh, take a look at those and provide any context. Obviously, those, these aren't items authored by administration or county council to be very clear, but to be able to provide comments uh, in advance so that those could be accounted for, incorporated at the supervisor's direction in bringing the item forward. That None of these items really deal with necessarily the, the kind of macro overall increase in volume. Um, the referral matrix that's attached separately um, just shows the current outstanding items. And obviously there's a great deal of difference in complexity associated with some of them or the amount of work that's involved, not reflected on, on some of these or some of the things that some of the supervisors commented on in our prior discussion, such as some of the, the need for administration, for instance, to be building out some of those business tools and infrastructure that's needed to provide data and other information. Um, you know, the way I kind of think about this, stepping several steps back, is that, you know, the most significant resource in some ways, um, at least for this conversation, uh, is really a question of how does the board want the time of uh, the key leadership of the organization allocated? And that's absolutely something to be done at the board's direction and based on the board's policy priorities. I think right now with the volume, um, that's happening uh, in just kind of a piecemeal basis. Um, and so to the extent that there's an ability to organize or collect some of those items, to maybe align them with some of the identified policy priorities, and to maybe set um, some of them as more kind of the nearer term goals, uh, that I think would all be helpful direction for all of us in making those allocations um, of time, as well as of course other decisions like budget. So I'll pause there. We've got folks available to help answer some questions. I, I don't think um, you know, we have the matrix attached as well. I don't think our intent was to try to walk through each item on the matrix, no. just so folks know. Um, but, uh, but definitely available to answer questions and then very eager to hear um, the discussion from the board. Thanks, James, and Megan and Sean and everyone that, that worked on this uh, report for us. Um, I really appreciate the, the analysis and the recommendations that were provided. Uh, my goal for uh, items seven and, and eight uh, to review is, is really to reflect on this board-directed work uh, that's outstanding, how we might um, prioritize it based on, on what James said and whatever else is, is our um, preference, um, and, and, and perhaps think about how, how we hold each other accountable uh, as we continue to bring forth uh, work. I'm gonna share just a couple of reflections uh, and then open up uh, for discussion. The significant increase in the volume of referrals um, in particular verbal direction at the board meetings um, is really worthy of, of consideration. At, at the core, I think this is, this is really about the quality of communication between board and staff. 
the four recommendations um, from staff I do think represent best practices that, that I hope all five of us will, will adopt to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and at the same time, I think there are important actions from staff that would help facilitate this improved and, and hopefully streamlined communication. And I'll offer three specific recommendations for administration. First, that ledge files and all meeting materials post on time with the agenda uh, on Wednesdays. This is really critical to allow board members and our staffs to review reports, to have time to uh, have discussions with administration or department folks uh, ahead of the meeting, as, as James recommended, as well as to allow the public to review and share their perspectives uh, with us. I, I think the, um, the habit of yellow tagging items or adding supplemental slides or materials uh, close to the meeting time uh, really needs to be minimized, if not avoided altogether. Uh, second, that staff take care to assure that reports back are responsive to the request. Uh, my sense is that many Deus referrals, and, and perhaps I'm only speaking for myself, and, and I did see how enormous my list was. Thank you very much. Um, whether in comments on, on consent or during the regular course of the meeting are often to address gaps in submitted materials or to refer items to ongoing discussion at a policy committee or a future board meeting. And I think that, that staff can help us minimize the requests by checking in with the supervisor that initiated a referral to assure that the submitted report is responsive to the original request prior to the agenda posting. And in the same way that staff is recommending that referrals be, be vetted by the board office um, before submitting, that same kind of vetting and review on reports back uh, might help reduce the number of follow-up requests. And lastly, um, I think that we should use the, the matrix as a tool to track progress, including distributing the electronic copy of the matrix to the board chiefs of staff every month, um, having the supervisors confirm that an item has been completed before removing from the, the matrix. So th those would be my suggestions. Very happy to, to hear whether those are in line with your thoughts or you've got additional, better, or, or replacements. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I think that the, the, um, the opportunity to restructure this is gonna be very um, instructive to the cultural relationship between the board and the staff. Because I think the point that you just raised was that here was staff's perspective, mm -hmm. um, here are our four things, and, and what you added was, well, here's what the board needs, and I think what would be ideal is if this came back in a shared format that has the board's requests and the staff's request and marries them. Mm. Because I, I think what you're raising is really important. I, I wanna ask um, a question of, of um, um, and Dr. Smith and um, James and Greta, whoever feels like this is most appropriate for you, I'm comfortable with any of you responding. But I, I do think that um, some of what Supervisor Ellenberg laid out really do have to do with some cultural challenges between the way the board, ha or maybe the board's expectations of staff and the staff's expectations of the board or the staff's expectations of the process as it relates to your side of the aisle. Because I sometimes feel like staff kind of gets caught in between the administration and the board, um, even at board meetings, you know, where we're asking questions and you, you just hear, crickets and I and I don't know if that means people are like Dr. Smith save me or there's a, a perspective that the administration has that maybe hasn't been yet shared with the board um, but I do feel like there's a gap there and I wonder if if you feel that also um, and if if so how what's your perspective on how to resolve it and if not um, I'll, I can follow up with some recommendations that I have I can probably address that best since I'm leaving <laughs> Um, we try to follow the charter. The charter is very specific that the board can ask for questions and make policy decisions, but not direct operations. 
And the reason for that is because we have five equal board members. And if we have five board members trying to direct operations, we end up in chaos. So, um, you know, some board members get in the habit of trying to tell departments what to do or tell, you know, staff what to do or having their board aides tell staff what to do. So we try to quash that as much as we can because it's not appropriate and not consistent with the charter. Um, I think that's it. So, um, for example, you know, um, <laughs> not, not it, I guess. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Well, <laughs> if you look at the board, at the charter and the board's um, policy directions in writing, for example, the policy committees are subcommittees that don't have the authority to approve or direct staff actions. Directing staff actions takes three votes of the board. But we oftentimes see subcommittees trying to direct actions without getting board action. That's a problem for us. Yeah, and I let me follow up on that one. I'm glad you raised it because I've, I've actually had some challenges with the Children's Family Seniors Committee around this subject. And I think that um, this is an opportunity and I, I do think it goes in this in this uh, body of work that there may be value in um, agendizing the the a, a more robust discussion about how items are supposed to move from committee to the full board, and and that way there's agreement across there's a standard operating procedure for all the all of the board, but also the staff, um, because depending on the board I'm on the the responsiveness of staff can be very different. And so I, I do think that, that that would be helpful for the board. Um, and let me just share, you know, kind of my perspective on this. My perspective is that, um, that there's a bright line and that the charter says a lot about what the board can do vis-a-vis -vis the staff. And your point always about making sure that you're, you know, that it's that three votes direct the, the work of the county is really important. There's, I, I actually had an opportunity to look at the charter because I, I thought that might come up today. And there's, a, and there's a part of the charter and it's section 302A that I, I would just ask my colleagues to take a look at. And the reason for that is that the beginning of that starts with the Board of Supervisors shall have the power to consolidate, segregate, transfer, abolish, or reassign the powers, duties, and functions of any appointed county office, commission, department, or division thereof whenever there's respective duties thereof are inconsistent. The board shall have the similar powers. You know, I mean, it's like a, like we both have power. So I, I just want to say that, that I think that where we need to move from is the from where we are now, which I sometimes feel is a bit of a stalemate to um, what you were raising, Susan, which is having clear expectations for all parties. I just want to um, give an ex uh, some feedback on the these examples. On item two, um, I, uh, by the way, on item one, I think that's really important on uh, removing items from consent. If if the boards, if all my colleagues are comfortable with that, the one thing I would say on that item is that. Um, often uh, we will ask questions, and this brings me actually rolls into item two, prior to the meeting, especially when we have the information beforehand, and staff um, is often not responsive. So my staff will give me the questions they sent, the date they sent it, crickets until Tuesday, and then we get either no information or more information. So what you often hear, at least from, my, from me, is asking something on the record, because the way it's been, I'm interpreting it, is that we asked for information about the item and it's gonna take an act of Congress or at least an act of the board to get the information we want, which is three votes. So I added uh, as a referral, which I would prefer not to do because I would prefer to have the information on items that I'm voting on. So I, I would absolutely think um, that I would request that, that we also have um, some sort of understanding of what it means to be responsive to um, board asking questions prior to the meeting so that we're not 
using everybody's time in a way that's inappropriate. And it, again, that's department by department, person by person, very different. I see Greta has her light on. Greta. I was gonna pick up on maybe the easiest part of the, the thing that you said <laughs> earlier, which is just about the sort of deer in headlights look that you sometimes see from staff. And one thing I am very excited about, about being back in person that I think is a, a simple thing is I, I do think um, one thing that I've noticed in this new role that's a, um, an, an area of, of um, my responsibility now that I think I hadn't quite thought about before was helping our departmental staff actually provide responsive answers to the board in response to their questions. So I'll just pick up on there have been a couple of discussions in the context of behavioral health where it's clear to me what a board member is getting at, which is to quote Supervisor Sumidian, the sort of how would I explain this at my sidewalk office hours type response. And I think sometimes our staff <laughs> haven't know how to answer the question for other experts in the field or know how to have the conversation with um, colleagues um, or, or their, super, their, their personal supervisor, their manager. Um, but struggle sometimes to translate that in the way that's actually the meaningful answer that the board member is looking for. So a lot of the time that we spend or sometimes the, the deer in headlights look is trying to, I think, them figure out what, how do I answer in a way that really is responsive to what I think the supervisor is getting at. And I think now that we're actually back in person, a little bit of ability for us to in real time make eye contact with the staff member to say, let me add on to what you said and maybe play that translating role may allow us better than even we were able to do not being in the same room as administration to provide the more robust and complete in-person response. And I think the other um, thing I'll just mention is, you know, the getting the questions in advance, I hear what you're saying, which is if you send them in advance and then you don't get the response back, well, that's not particularly helpful. Um, but I do, I do think sometimes, um, for staff also trying to figure out how to have the conversation with the supervisor to be able to, to go back and forth in real time even before the board meeting, which sometimes isn't feasible. Where we've been able to do that, I think often gets a much more satisfying and complete um, either answer to the supervisor's question or even sets them up to ask what are a little bit more targeted questions during the board meeting because they now have at least gotten all of the contextual questions answered um, and also allows us to make sure we're bringing the right staff. So I'm hopeful that some of the um, benefits of the in-person format that we now get to enjoy together will alleviate at least what's been some of our um, pain points in these areas over the last couple of years. Well, let me uh, show you online the uh, sections of the charter that you refer to and what we're concerned about. You'll notice that it says the board shall have the power to consolidate and do all these things with appointed county offices. And then here in section 303, except for the purposes of inquiring information, neither the board nor any member thereof shall deal with any administrative officer or employee appointed by the county executive except through the county executive. So you can tell me what to do because I'm appointed, but you can't tell Greta what to do because she's appointed by me. Yeah, I think we all understand that, Jeff. I think the reason I the reason I raise this is that, in some respects, I think um, this goes back to the question I was raising about culture. And my concern is that if we it, and the reason I think transparency actually has to be really core is that my concern is that there isn't enough transparency between the administration and the and the board on occasion. And to go back to a point that Supervisor Allenberg raised is that that if we're not getting questions responded to or the referral comes back after a, a unanimous vote of the board and is still not responsive or doesn't come back for months and months, those are all problems. And so I, I think that what I would just wanna add to the really good ideas that Supervisor Ellenberg had was making sure that there's um, a pretty strong understanding of what it means to be responsive before the board meeting, that the, um, that there is also um, that the the issue about making sure that there is responsiveness to the actual referral, and I think it, Susan's right that if there's an, a request that we share the written referrals with the 
the administration before they become fo come forward. I think that it's very fair to have the same happen with the board or some subset of the board that brought an initiative forward. And then the other thing I would add as um, I would add a five and a six, and I think the responsiveness is a is the six. And then the other I would just recommend for you all is that sometimes that you will also say, hey, we'll we'll bring an off off agenda report to respond to a question that that you also may just need a minute to be able to get somebody there to respond and so that you're not writing another report. I I I so I would encourage you also to if an agenda item gets pulled off unexpectedly because the community has a concern and you need to get the right staff that is part of the agenda um, um, activity in the morning, you say, look, we're going to need to hear that after lunch. I want to make sure we have the right people so that we're not doing the dueling reports because that takes months and months. It's, it's a lot of work on your part. It's a lot of um, consternation on our part and the public's part. But more than that, it, it feels like it can be a lot of extra work. So that, that would be an item I would want to also recommend. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President. Um, first of all, I just want to say uh, a huge thank you uh, to our staff and administration overall for always answering many of those questions as posed by our office prior to the meeting. And we've been trying to be good about that, asking these questions as soon as we got the agenda, get the material, try to go through it as quickly as we can, try to get to you before Friday. Uh, and, and the fact that those are all answers Saturday, sometimes Sunday, sometimes on Monday, uh, it's, it's really, really helpful. And because those are, and I'll say at least half uh, of those questions, and usually all of them were answered uh, thoroughly, and frankly, does not need to be bring, brought up at the board meeting. And by doing so, it saves everybody's time, right? Uh, and also avoid the potential gotcha moment from the dais and, and, and surprise staff, and we don't want to do that. Um, and so forth. So it only allows me to only bring up questions that was not covered or might be considered informative to the public uh, on an important point on that relevant issue. And so I think that I, I, I really appreciate that work. And I just want to say a huge thank you for staff on, on that. And, and we will try to do a better job on continuing doing that. Uh, on the other item number three, request input from administration on referral response timeline. My bad. Oftentimes, I would ask for a report back, but not provide any de deadline. And, and I, you know, there's no deadline. Things don't happen, even though there's a standard time period. So I'll definitely try to do better on laying out and asking for the timeline. Asking for their recommended timeline? Right, exactly. Asking for them to recommend a timeline so that a, a date certain is on that request back so there'll be no confusion, right? Uh, on number four, regarding the preview written referrals uh, prior to posting the agenda, um, I, that's the other thing that I certainly do uh, ascribe to my staff, uh, making sure that my folks do get these uh, uh, draft referral uh, to be reviewed by staff first because um, the negative is it takes an extra meeting, right? It takes a couple of extra weeks uh, to, to, to look at the stuff and not hitting the agenda soon, but it's extremely helpful. And, and so I really tried our best in our office to use the staff's expertise and the council review to making sure this stuff uh, uh, comes through is, is, uh, is cleaner and, and, and raise less problem down the road. So I certainly wonder, appreciate that very, very much. Um, on what the supervisor, uh, our President Ellenberg has mentioned uh, of how uh, when staff comes back with these reports, um, I really do think that there's a uh, extra steps there if, as recommended to go back to the requesting supervisor uh, to have a, a, a preview of it, let's say, so that to make sure that the answer really answers the requesting question. Uh, otherwise, sometimes when this comes back and then it doesn't meet our need and then they just have to go back and re-agendize and go back. So that's all of uh, um, consternation potentially and confusion. Um, and, and, and one thing I would ask staff is, look, when the, at the heat of the moment, when we're asking these referral, we're adding these additional things on the dais, an amendment to the third amendment to the motion from the other supervisor, uh, a lot of these things get really jumbled. <laughs> and I think staff has to go back to listen to it so many times, like, what do you really want, right? I, I think it's really helpful, maybe, uh, from us as to whoever that individual was making these uh, ask uh, for staff to just come back to us after the meeting and say, hey, you, you said this on the dais. Is that really what you want? I think that 
that give and take potentially could help uh, clear up some of these confusion potentially down the road. So I just say that's something that I would recommend maybe we could do a little bit better on, on the communication. I think that would be great. Thank you, Supervisor Arredas. Oh, I'm so sorry. How do I look both ways? I appreciate that. We need to have Beth? a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that we're asking for is the issue of taking items off the consent before we discuss them any more. And other than, you know, what James mentioned about making clarity about what the question is and increasing the communication as Supervisor Lee uh, mentioned, I also have worries that a lot of times we get into situations where we're discussing things that aren't appropriately notified by the Brown Act. You know, so like we'll bring up something on the consent calendar that says, you know, approve this contract. And then suddenly we're talking about give us a report about this whole subject matter. And, you know, that's unfair to the community and questions our ability to comply with the Brown Act because if we're gonna be asking for a full report on a different subject, we need to notify the board that we're, or notify the public that we're doing that. And I get really concerned about that. So I just wanted to put those two cents in. Are you finished? Supervisor Arenas. Oh, hi. Um, uh, super interesting conversation and actually allows me as a new member to um, integrate into uh, your typical protocol and some of the areas impr of improvement so that we can um, have a richer discussions and, and come up with the framework that um, for all of us to ultimately come up with better decisions for, for our community. So this is really wonderful. I absolutely love the the four items of recommend uh, the recommendations. I see those also as best practices, as some of my colleagues have already mentioned them to be. And this is, I, I, I'm not kidding, but this is exactly what I would typically do. Uh, um, you all call them legislative files here. We called them memos at the city, and this, ex this is exactly what. It, um, I would, um, the process I would utilize um, because it, if it really the dais isn't um, a, an opportunity to surprise people, but really to move our priorities forward and to build consensus. And I've always been used to what the city already has, which is uh, 10 days in advance um, in terms of, uh, I'm thinking about the, this, uh, the sun shining of, of some of these items, huh? Staff. Of staff reports, excuse me. And we, we already have a, a timeline of 10 days. Um, and so it, there isn't a question of when I'm, of course, everybody waits until the very last minute because we all have a workload that is intense, especially post pandemic. Um, but but holding my breath and hoping that something's gonna get posted, especially on an item that I, I'm really passionate about is, um, uh, just creates a lot of, of question, right? Um, for example, today I didn't know enough about the process and what, what that, and I'm uh, discovering now that we're actually establishing the process as we're discussing it, right? So we're building the, the, the plane as we fly it, um, which is, you know, has its drawbacks and it also has a lot of advantages, especially for somebody new like me. So um, I'm, I'm gonna take advantage of, of this opportunity to, to also just ask for us to um, establish some, some kind of timeline that would uh, respect, uh, uh, the workload on both sides, both administration and the policymakers. Um, and what I was getting to was because I didn't know enough, I was going to, typically this is my fallback, I'm gonna write a memo asking these questions so that you all know ahead of time where my, um, where I'm leaning 
and uh, if it was a policy decision where I'm leaning or uh, the direction I'd like to see administration take. Um, and then we all have these ahead of time um, so that we can all uh, learn ahead of uh, the meeting. Well, Cindy's coming from this, uh, excuse me, uh, Supervisor Travis is coming from this certain perspective and Supervisor Simidian from this other perspective and, and so and so. Um, and then it, it starts to um, feel like, uh, well, where can we meet in the middle? Where is the middle? If two of us are on a very extreme <laughs> sides, then it's gonna be a very long discussion or if three of us are on uh, 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 extreme ends of the discussion. And so I think for, for me, um, what I would fall back to is a memo. Uh, a legislative file. So I, I don't know what the um, practice is here, but I'd love to, um, and if uh, people would just take the time to let me know, and I'm slowly exploring, but isn't isn't that something that we, that typically we could um, utilize it as a tool to actually begin the conversation before we begin the conversation, but also respect the timeline and, and bring the, the information that we need, that baseline information at a certain timeline. Um, so then we could then have this back and forth behind uh, the scenes, just the technical questions, nothing because of lack of transparency, just uh, let me understand this correctly. Um, and then we write a legislative file that would reflect our, our points that we wanna make and potentially a recommendation. Um, I know that was a lot, but hopefully, I, but, um, give me a but, it's, <laughs> but it's all important, and, and I'll look to Dr. Smith to um, respond both in terms of feasibility and Brown Act. Sure. Um, as long as there's an understanding that the memos are, you know, public records, um, mm -hmm. you know, we would be, from a staff perspective, very happy to get memos from the board members, you know, asking questions or expressing opinions um, as long as we comply with all the Brown Act requirements. Um, James, do you have a different opinion? No, I, you know, I think having the information in advance is really helpful. Um, you know, there, there was, um, and some, some board offices do this now, but it is, there was a more common kind of past practice of, um, you know, sometimes pre-meeting on a specific item, getting questions answered, having some conversation, you know, before an item came forward, just, you know, with one supervisor's office, so there was no Brown Act issue involved. Um, but just making sure that, that, that folks had what they needed in terms of background information, right? And, and you know, that's, a, I think, especially true given just the breadth of items that come come up. Um, and, you know, I think that can be helpful to the point that Greta was making earlier uh, in response to, um, you know, question about how sometimes, sometimes staff is kind of focused on more technical response and there needs to be an opportunity to engage in a little bit more just conversation about, okay, well, what is the background here? Or what's the history or what else has happened? Or is there some information? and um, you know, I think probably in part because of COVID and the fact that people have been more remote, uh, there's been a decrease in that the last few years, um, and maybe due to other factors as well. But I definitely, I have noticed at least a significant decrease in, in, um, utilizing that mechanism of pre-meeting if there's a specific item where there's just a need for some more background information. I feel like that used to be much more commonplace, and I do think it was helpful for the discussion that then was happening, you know, during the meeting. And maybe that's why we, you you all had a 76 percent verbal um, referrals. I definitely think that's a right. factor. I think it's it, a factor. Yeah, and um, and but but I also think that there's there's more to it than just that. It's maybe the lack of establishing that practice back again, right? Um, but I'm glad we're having this, this conversation it allows me to understand um, for this uh, group 
what we would all like to see, um, but also administration, what would be useful um, so that we can create um, a, a perfect environment of collaboration and, and then also bring in our stakeholders. So um, I don't know for me that there's anything missing. Uh, um, I think uh, Supervisor um, Ellenberg, you've already talked about the sun shining um, timeline and so hopefully that gets integrated into um, it, into uh, a motion. Actually, I, let me take a step back. There is um, one thing that I'd like to see and surprise, I'm gonna talk about equity. <laughs> so I think for some of these um, legislative files, um, there's impact uh, statements around children and seniors and I forget the other area um, but I'm hoping that we could also accomplish um, integrating equity uh, the equity lens into not only um, uh, th the whole legislative file um, but in those impacts particularly in those impact statements um, so that we can as we are moving through this conversation of having a common understanding of what equity is and and um, and making sure that our that the policymakers and the uh, operation side of the the agency and the folks who are carrying out the work have the same practices and have the same understanding and um, we're all uh, in line with with what our policy is overall telling us um, how to function, but we can't do that if 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 um, we don't use this language on an ongoing basis. And I'm not asking for us to include a direct um, impact statement that has to do with equity. What I'm asking if, is if um, maybe our office of I'm going to get this wrong. Social justice. Diversity, equity, and belonging. You got it. <laughs> Office of belonging. Yes. Um, could review a format uh, or could make some recommendations on how to integrate equity, um, le an equity lens into um, all legislative files by asking who's, in, who's most impacted, who does this, you know, maybe some of the uh, uh, inadvertent uh, outcomes that happen because of policy. Uh, so anyways, I'm, I'm hoping that could also enrich um, how these legislative files have uh, as a tool to, to grow our conversations. I think we should already begin with equity and I'm sure you all do, but I, I haven't seen it operationalized either on, in legislative files, so thank you. Oh, and I don't know if you all want to provide me with a, a quick response on that one. Two responses over here and then um, to Supervisor Chavez, please. I was just going to say, since I don't hear any objection from the rest of the board, um, we can certainly go back and um, work on a proposal and come back to the board for approval on how to specifically address equity impacts in each um, transmittal that we develop which may be part of the equity tool discussion. Yeah, um, I'm just so yes. throwing it out if that's what the board wants. Thank you, Greta. Oh, I was gonna say something similar, and I'm, you know, I'm interested in, I, I think, to your point, Supervisor Adonis, I think we're, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to have really meaningful conversations about equity, and one just kind of practical thing I'll observe is I think as we've added those different sections over time, People almost have sort of formulaic responses that they use there, and so um, maybe really going to the point of kind of better um, collaboration and, and communication between staff and the board on what are your kind of true priorities, I think it would be worth our while kind of reconsidering as a whole that section of legislative files and how do we bring back um, responses that really hit the kind of um, analysis you're looking for as opposed to ending up kind of adding an additional, what will become almost boilerplate on equity to what has become almost boilerplate in these other ways, which I think is exactly your point. So really to kind of expand maybe how we think about that um, practice that we've adopted over years and built on and really um, maybe come back with a, a fulsome assessment of how, how we can revisit that in a different way. 
Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, I, I, um, I just wanted to ask uh, James's question. It, it was really in response to a point that Dr. Smith raised about um, items that are not on the agenda being discussed. And I wonder if, it, I mean, it seems like you jump in when you think that's happening. Um, are you not jumping in when you think that's happening? Uh, I would say two things on that point. One is um, during the era of online meetings, it, it was harder to jump in or I may have communicated something to the chairperson that sometimes took a while for that person to receive and respond to um, that is a little easier to do, I think, in person. Um, and in general, um, my philosophy has been to try to err on the side of allowing conversation to occur. Um, we have, I think, strayed a, a few times, and there's certainly been some times when I've definitely spoken up specifically. Um, so it's, 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 you know, it's a little bit, um, it's not a mathematical formula, obviously. Right. Uh, but right. the, you know, it's, it's a question of is it, would the public reasonably have notice that what's being discussed is covered within the subject matter of the verbiage that's listed on the agenda for that item. Well, and I would imagine that new direction from the county is different than getting an information for, I mean, a request for information. Uh, yes, I think, I think where, um, I think where this has been probably the most significant challenge a little bit has been where there's been discussion because um, part of the Brown Act issue is around the deliberation among the body. So of I think course. where it's just a discreet request for information, that's a little different than where it's a conversation that may be happening. Well, I can honestly say I never imagined you weren't piping up. So <laughs> that was an astounding thing to hear Dr. Smith say, <laughs> having known you all these years. But I appreciate the point you're raising about the mechanics of it, just given the new, the old environment. Yeah. and. And I hope that you and the chair can work out a, you know, a shoe throwing or something that's a little more instant, because uh, because I do think that's really important. I don't want to. It was that. definitely easier pre-pandemic, and hopefully now that we're back in chambers, because I have the ability to turn my mic on, have the light show, you know, or or give kind of a cue that's not as much as me literally interrupting somebody in the middle of speaking which I've done a few times, but I try to avoid as much as I can. Thank you. Um, the other issue that I wanted to ask about was the referrals that come out of a motion. And um, I, I wonder, and I don't know who did this analysis, but I'm, I'm wondering if, um, I mean, the, the, way I, the way I have interpreted that at meetings when there's a, a, a motion is that if there's, if the staff brings a direction and the board doesn't agree and the board changes it, that in your mind is a referral? Or if there's additions because it wasn't complete? I mean, this goes back to the point that Susan raised earlier, but is that, is that a referral? The, the additions are included, yes. So if there's, you know, if there's a change, um, but usually what it is is more a request to come back with some additional pieces of things, right? And so that would be yeah, reported I, as a referral. I think that that one is, to me, um, if you wanna quantify that because it becomes a workload issue, to me that's different than you actually getting a referral from the from the board because most often my, my observation of those has been when the board is given direction and there's a conflict between what the administration is offering and what the board initially um, wanted or the new information the board th that we get from administration changes the structure of the approach the board's taking. And I only say that, colleagues, because to me that's not necessarily a sign of the board, you know, being um, negligent in our responsibilities. It really, I think, has more to do with how we can improve communication. I think it goes back, Susan, to the mm -hmm. very first thing that you said in this section, and I, I just want to amplify that. I think you're I think the way you framed it was really right on, and I think that point you raised was really important. And 
and as it relates to future analysis, I think it would, it, which I don't think is a bad thing, I think it's worth us diving in a little more to that because I think that speaks more to the communication between the board as a whole and the staff as a whole, not even individual offices necessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Greta, and then we will move on to item uh, nine. I just wanted to um, bring up one point that I think is kind of overarching to some of the conversations, which is just the volume point. And I'll just say, I think from an operational reality standpoint, I agree that a lot of times the responses don't, um, certainly don't reflect kind of the best work, the most complete work that we could bring forward. And I think sometimes that's also a function of just the scrambling to try and meet the volume and the deadlines. And so I just wanted to name that as also kind of an interrelated um, challenge that we face is sometimes when we're coming up on the 45 day deadlines, the work that we can produce by some of those timelines isn't complete in our minds. And so it makes sense then there's a request for additional information, but it then um, means that that referral is not done while other ones then come. And so I think that there, I think the, the shared goal of the board and staff going forward is gonna be to sort of have fewer referrals and higher quality responses. And I think all of the suggestions that I'm hearing come forward are really um, aimed toward that end. So I just wanted to name that um, as one thing. And then the other observation I just wanted to make is, you know, we're sort of talking, we use the term referral to cover a really broad variety of things. There are what I would say are, um, when I first joined the county, which is sort of at the beginning of, of some of these charts that we've been looking at, a type of referral that would be a very sweeping, significant um, kind of new policy initiative that I would see coming forward at, those, at, at that time with more frequency, as opposed to things that we also refer to as referrals, which are really almost requests for information that could be addressed through a, an email after the board meeting. And so I just want to name the distinction there because I think it would be a disservice to some of our goals to get better, more robust responses if we, for, like, I'll just pick up on one example. I don't think that the board's intention would be for a board member who asks a question to then see the response to that question that could go out to the full board via email in advance to make sure it's responsive. Whereas certainly maybe if we're talking about something that's a really significant policy endeavor that that board member is championing, kind of understanding what the direction is in the dialogue that I think we really historically did have with that board member to make sure that we were deeply understanding their policy goals with the referral and kind of bringing forward a response that was really aligned with those. So I wanted to make those two comments that I think are animating some of my reflections on this discussion. Thank you. Can I, I get light? two you, cents? You can have two cents and then really, really, we're going to item nine. Um, the practicality of having some time expectations is that um, basically when we get a referral from the dais saying come back in two weeks, that means come back in three days because we have to go through the entire um, part process of agendizing and getting all the information. So that effectively puts that referral at the beginning of highest priority of the list and everything else falls behind. So in effect, what's happening is the referrals are determining what your board's policy priorities are because we can't work on other things when we're pushed into tight deadlines. Thank you. Uh a lot of truth telling here today, I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna move for real onto items nine and 10, but before we do, I just wanna make a, a quick announcement. I did announce at the very beginning of the meeting that there would be one public comment session on both on items on the agenda and off of the agenda, um, but there may have been some members of the public that didn't hear that and were caught off guard. So what I would like to do to remedy that is um, before we hear item 11, which is really, uh, before we adjourn. So after the discussion on item 10, I'm going to offer an additional uh, two minute comment period for members of the public um, related to any of the agenda items. We're not gonna do separate uh, times for all of the items, but we will offer um, a two minute 
um, speaking period, and uh, apologies if that wasn't made clear to everybody. And um, I have really appreciated the the flow of, of this conversation amongst my, my colleagues, which is why uh, I chose this format so that uh, unlike a regular business board meeting, this is an opportunity for, for some deep discussions that, that I think have been um, very productive amongst the, the board and administration. So thank you all for that. And finally, um, there may be some interest in, some topic, in this topic. So let's move on to a report on the budget equity tool. The mics aren't working? Ah. Inside knowledge. Good afternoon. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Ana Lilia Garcia. I am the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging, which is part of the Division of Equity and Social Justice in the County Executive's Office. The Office of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging was established in 2021 to strengthen county and departmental programs, services, initiatives, and policies to advance equity in government. In 2020, the Board of Supervisors adopted the use of the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, framework, normalize, organize, and operationalize. GARE is a national network of government municipalities working to address systemic inequities by establishing a set of principles, strategies, and resources that are made available to support government in making tangible improvements in how we do business to improve the lives of the communities we serve. In August of 2020, the board adopted the equity work plan, formally stating the county's commitment to the use of principles of equity in policy and budgeting decisions to prioritize accessibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion across departments and services. This is in part due to the racial unrest that resulted from the murder of George Floyd and the many lives lost before and after him due to police brutality, racial injustice, oppression, and violence, which sparked nationwide and local protests demanding reform. A budget equity tool is an example of a racial equity impact assessment tool or a racial equity toolkit, and it is designed to integrate explicit considerations of racial and economic equity into the budget development process. The first iteration of the county's budget equity tool was developed in collaboration with the Office of Budget and Analysis and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging. The budget equity tool is informed by and builds on national best practice from other government ju jurisdictions doing equity work across the country. County application of a uniform budget equity tool provides county departments and agencies with a structured way to apply equity concepts to key decision-making processes around resource allocation and assess equity impacts of budgetary decisions. In essence, it provides a check and balance approach to better decision-making that can be qualified and quantified beyond concepts, which is helpful in evaluating whether we are indeed making strides in our collective goal of meeting community needs in a way that mitigates additional harms that historically have, caused, have been caused by exclusionary governmental policies and decisions. To support departments in the completion of the budget equity tool between October and December of 2022, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Belonging and OBA in partnership with GARE facilitated eight trainings and workshops with executive leadership, fiscal teams and program teams on foundational concepts and on the budget equity tool itself. Consultation and dropping sessions for technical assistance are currently in progress. Good afternoon, this is Tony Fleece and I'm a budget and financial planning manager in the County Executive's Office of Budget and Analysis. As a result of this process, in the months to come, we will be reviewing the equity impacts and measures of success and alignment with strategic goals to ensure the requests are strategically considered. OBA analysts will also be incorporating equity-specific guiding questions into the existing process for developing recommended actions 
to support analysis of the equity impact of each budget proposal. We understand that the budget is a priority setting document and a reflection of our values. And we are excited for additional data on equity impacts so that can be part of the consideration. To that end, the board will see a recommended budget that has integrated an equity lens which will support the board in their role as policymakers. We see value in data sharing among departments for equity impacts and encouraging collaboration among departments in submitting their budget requests. Also in recognizing that some of their needs may not be addressed if another department has a greater need. In the first year of formalizing this process, there is a recognition that every department is in a different place and it will take time to develop the institutional muscle to normalize conversations about equity. We will continue to provide foundational trainings to ensure everyone is aware and able to utilize this tool and to learn from departments that are further along in their knowledge and comfort with this work. The departmental submission of budget equity tools will be an iterative process. From discussions with other jurisdictions as the county matures in, it, in its advancement of equity, the budget equity tool will evolve and subsequent iterations will build upon the lessons learned in the initial budget cycle to ensure it is working in our organization and having an impact. With that, we wanna provide an example for consideration of what we're trying to achieve and what the board we believe will celebrate as well. It is an example of collaboration between departments about being strategic and also accounting for equity impacts. It's regarding funding for our isolation and quarantine program and will be a collaboration be between OSH, Public Health Department, and potentially Valley Healthcare down the road. It will benefit those without resources and from underserved populations, and it is key to our mission as well. It is an example of us being strategic, collaborative, and also factoring the importance of equity. That concludes our overview when we are available for questions, and Budget Director Ituria is also available. Thank you very much for the report. Um, looking to colleagues for comments or, or questions. Supervisor Chavez. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for the report. Um, I was hoping you could talk just a little bit about the, the current level of training, and um, I know uh, my staff had a chance to speak to you beforehand, um, but what, I, what was unclear to me when I was um, reviewing the notes was how many people uh, are being trained um, Face to face versus online, and then, and this may be a question, Dr. Smith, uh, for you, or Greg, who is obligated to be trained? Thank you for your question, Supervisor Chavez. I can answer the first part of the question. Uh, these trainings are virtual. And we have invited uh, fiscal teams and a program staff to participate in the training. Uh, the trainings uh, are about three to four hours long. And then if I could also just add in, sorry, Megan Doyle, Deputy County Executive. We've had trainings of um, our executive leadership group, which is basically all folks in the executive um, salary ordinance. So that's like, you know, department heads, deputy directors and such, including fiscal folks. And then also we had a in-person um, like tabletop discussion with department heads um, that happened in December to, with um, Dr. Garcia and her team and, um, and Greg Aturia doing, doing overarching training to department heads. I can maybe follow up. Um, there's two types of training. One is the training on the budget tool and that will focus on the department heads and the fiscal staff within the departments. Um, but then there's the GAIR training, which is a, um, important training that's not necessarily connected to the budget. We're hopeful that we're gonna be able to train the entire county in the GAIR training, but that's a very ambitious goal because it's you know 23,000 people. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that I distinguished that. 
But yeah, and today we're really talking about the budget tool. Right. Yeah. And and the reason I was asking about the the um, obligation is I'm presuming then that there's a framework that they follow for the for the budget process. And yeah. is that like a, a form that people fill out or what's the what's the actual tool tool? Through the chair, so Supervisor Chavez, as part of the budget equity training, as Dr. Garcia mentioned, uh, several hundred uh, program and fiscal staff from departments were included in the training. And so as part of that, it's going through the budget equity tool document and the questions that need to be answered in order to request um, any budget actions. And so that's, that's part of what departments will be submitting on February 3rd. So, um, just so I understand what the product is, is it a is it a, a form they fill out as they bring their budget document forward? Is it a set of guidelines that you're asking them to follow? How, how does that get expressed actually physically through the process? Sure, let me guide you to packet page 46. And Cynthia, would you be able to put that on the screen? Yeah, yes, just give me I, one I have moment. that. So, is this the form? This form comes in with the budget as they as they present it to Dr. Smith. So, in looking at this packet page, what we're asking departments to do in submitting their budget requests is to classify the request either as direct service or indirect service or infrastructure, and include that in the the budget form with the proposal. So I guess what I'm asking is, am I looking at the form, or is there is this is there some other form that this is embedded in? No, you're looking at sort of the questions that will inform what the departments are providing us. But but you're not looking at the form because that's a different that's so, part of the budget process. Right. So yet to clarify, the form <laughs> is in our budget system. So, are these questions then embedded in the budget system? No, there's an equity impact section of the budget system. That okay, departments so fill then, out. then this is supposed to guide that little section. Correct. Okay, so, so is that because this is step one or phase one, and eventually something will act, it will actually be embedded in our our overall budgeting tool? And the reason I'm saying this is, you know, the com conversation we were just having about the impact of children and seniors on all of our documents or sustainability. To me, the, that 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 approach ha has not, at least for me, um, really lifted up the. You know, sometimes, honestly, I know people cut and paste it because you see the weirdest things in that box. <laughs> or, oh no, there's no no impact, and there's a ton of impact because it's about seniors. But I, that, so, is that where we're starting? And and that's okay if that's where we're starting because initially I know that would not be the impact. But well, is me. the long-term goal to actually embed it into the budget documents and proposals that Dr. Smith gets, and then that we see? Let me uh, jump in. I think I understand the question. The budget submittal process from the departments to the county uh, budget office and then to the county executive in preparation for the recommended budget are all electronic and we're in the process of changing the um, system because we don't think it has enough flexibility. So for now, we're asking in a blank um, area of the um, spreadsheet for those questions that you mentioned to be answered and then we follow up in uh, meeting staff meetings with the department heads and the finance staff in person and we ask them to explain more then what you're talking about is when the the recommended budget is created into a book and sent to the board and we will expand on that so that that section has more information, as much information as we can, you know, appropriately get into it. So when the board sees the recommended budget in book form, we'll be able to see an explanation of equity. Now, as Anna Lilia pointed out, you know, we certainly expect some departments to do better than others. Um, it will be hard for departments that focus on internal services like 
TSS to have any significant explanation of equity impacts. But, you know, it's a start. I guess, um, if I, let me just go back to the point you raised. The, so the budget, the way the budget process is structured right now, the f we aren't able to change the, the format to include this new lens today. Yeah. Like that's something that would have to you come down You mean to the include road. those questions specifically? Yeah, I, I guess I would, yes. Because you made a comment about just the, the budget I, infrastructure. I'm presuming what that means is whatever we're using, whatever tool we're using online. Yeah, the budget document, budget electronic documents are basically spreadsheets, proprietary spreadsheets. You know, it's like an access document, so different fields. And each proposal has a, a number and what the proposal is and a description of why it's needed, the cost, you know, blah, 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 and a bunch of other stuff, the budget unit. Um, it doesn't have room right now for all the questions we would like to ask. That's why we're changing it because it's not as flexible as we'd like it to be. But since we do have room for a narrative explanation of the, the equity impacts, we're asking the departments to put that in to the spreadsheet. And when we meet with them to go over their proposals, we'll ask for more detail so that we can put more detail into the budget book. So, um if, as um, as budget proposals come forward, if if you were looking at um, you know trying to uh, quantify outcomes as part of the current way the budget is structured, like for example, if there was a proposal that had um, that that was something that you would rank high as it relates to equity. Is there another place on the budget proposal that would come through? And in particular, what I'm asking about is as it relates to outcomes, you know, in terms of by investing this amount of money, it would increase services by this amount for this many people that are in this targeted community. Does the budget document allow you to do that now? And is that also, you know, yeah. That. Well, you know, when you see the recommended budget, you see a lot of narrative plus a bunch of tables that have budgetary units and dollars attached. The um, budget, electronic budget document that we use really only comes up with the numbers and the tables. All of the rest of the narrative is created by us after talking with the department heads. Some of it's created by the departments it's all done really um, after the balancing of the spreadsheets. So that will all be included, yes. But it's not do the, in the IT system. Yeah, through the board president, if, if I may, this is Greg Gutierrez, County Budget Director. I've been <laughs> trying to find the right way to, to insert myself without interrupting. Voice of God. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, Certainly, you know, th there's no restriction in our in our processes or, or systems from the, the sharing of information, you know, from the departments. You know, we do have a, an open system where uh, departments submit their proposals and where they enter, in, like as Dr. Smith mentioned, they enter electronically. What is the service impact? You know, what's the equity uh, uh, impact if known? You know, what what's the cost? All, all these things. And then also we have places to you know invite and for them to attach supplemental information if they have data, particularly if they have data that shows here's the anticipated outcome or impact to this group or or to the um, uh, to this consideration. If they have all that, that's all available. So I don't I don't want to give the impression that that there's a systematic uh, you know impossibility to communicate all the information. It's there. It's it's actually it's quite open from that that uh, respect but we're but it's an electronic form as this was mentioned it's not a necessarily a piece of paper that you fill out like when I first had to fill out budget requests 30 years ago at the start of my career we're able to do it all digitally now that's all 
So you have the capacity then to in, to be inclusive of of these of some of these key questions. Absolutely. Okay, that's helpful yeah. because I think what that what that may may mean is that um, as it relates to how what opportunity there may be for the the board and the public to see what we're prioritizing and why that could be really um, very helpful because what I worry a little bit about is um, moving down a track too far that is so um, subjective that it's not, you know, and I think, Ana Lilia, the challenge that you and Tony are going to have across the organization is um, creating some shared um, vision around w w what it means and then how it gets implemented. And I don't think there's anything more important than the county budget as a tool to reflect that. So one thing I, that just as one member of the board, I think being able to um, give some sort of clear indication in the, in the budgeting process is really where I think we should be. And I recognize we're pretty close to that process now, so I'm not, you know, I don't, I, I'm not trying to upset the apple cart, but I, I don't think we should go through another bu budget process without that being embedded into the actual software and, or the actual framework with um, some indi indicator for Dr. Smith or other folks that are gonna be both making advice to the board, but also for the board to be able to understand the actual implications and impact of the investments that we're making. And, and while it's not on the agenda to talk about budget, when we do start to talk about budget, this will also be um, an opportunity for us to talk about how we um, can do more around accountability in terms of how much we're spending to, for what outcome overall. All right, thank you. Thank you for that really, um, really very thorough and thoughtful exchange. Um, and Anna Lily, I saw you you nodding, and I and I wonder if and I heard Dr. Smith loud and clear and knew before that I'm not directing work to you, but curious as to whether your work plan happens to um, include a budget analysis, um, a proposed budget analysis. Um, using the, the expertise and values of your office so that we could have an accompanying uh, statement, kind of like an, a, an audit, maybe an equity audit, that, that gives an accounting of how we're actually doing and where we spend our money. Thank you for your question, Supervisor Ellenberg. That's actually uh, something that we are having conversations about and considering uh, there's gonna be a lot of rich data coming from this process. Uh, so this is an opportunity to evaluate that process and better understand from an equity lens and from our team to explore further. So that is something that we are considering in this year. Thank you, and, and if that consideration continues to move forward, is that something that would be in place in time for evaluating the 23-24 fiscal budget? I'll have to get back to you on the timeline. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, other questions or comments on this item? Supervisor Irenas. I know everyone's surprised that I would have questions about this item. Um, I think you heard me earlier, um, and good afternoon, I was in the back but uh, listening. Um, I think you heard, uh, you might have heard some of the conversation we had, we've been having, um, and from the beginning I thought it was important for us to um, anchor uh, I know it's very strange. We can hardly see each other, but um, I'll stretch my that neck and that you stretch yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, think I, I thought it was really important to have this conversation anchored around equity. And although I think that m my colleagues and, and definitely the organization and administration has uh, equity as the North Star, we also need to memorialize it somehow, right? And institutionalize it into the everyday work that we we have. And so I, I, my first question is, is I wanna just check in with you and I think we, you and I, we've had some, uh, some conversations just to familiar, to have my team familiar and myself become familiarized with the work that you're doing on this side of the county. Um, and there's differences between what the city's doing and what the county's doing because we're two different organizations. Um, we have been using the budget equity tool and I thought it was just 
um, wonderful um, uh, opportunity for us to gather information. What is, how are we going to create a baseline of information um, from this budget equity tool without having direct input from stakeholders um, and, uh, and, and families? Um, I know that we're going to gather some information that we already have, but how are we gonna offset for, for that direct input, from the lack of direct input? Thank you for your question. Uh, sorry, I can't really see you. I There's, know, I'm so I'm I'm short. I'm <laughs> uh, the existing budget equity tool uh, that was co-developed this past year has uh, three questions. Um, and I believe it was referred to page 47 in your packet. Uh, question number three speaks to, alludes to a little bit what you're getting at. Describe how the needs of a specific community or stakeholder informed the budget request or issue area. So in question number three, without explicit calling out community engagement, it, it really speaks to the opportunity to incorporate voices and perspectives at the program level, if, as one example, from existing uh, data sources, e existing inputs, and also population level indicators or um, community health assessments that we have gathered over the years, like the Office of LGBT, uh, the LGBTQ Health Assessment, Children's Health Assessment, so on and so forth that can be found on the Public Health website. Uh, we have multiple inputs to qualitative data where we have engaged our stakeholders, we have, where we have engaged our um, communities most impacted by particular issues at hand. It's an important place to begin. Um, it's really important that uh, we look at existing information in this very first year. Um, this is our first try at this. I, you alluded to the efforts at the city and other jurisdictions across the country have been doing this a little bit longer. This is our first take at this, and really want it to be thoughtful, intentional, and strategic in, in not just the development of the tool, but the implementation. And it's going to be an iterative process, an opportunity for us to continuously evaluate and learn from and improve upon lessons learned. Right, oh, and, well, and that's what I was um, getting to, is that th because this is your first year, and because you're gathering some of the data from past uh, data gathering. Yeah. I, I don't know if you already anticipated that these sources of data um, would be tapped in the future for a budget equity tool, and would those groups answer the question that you need answered in terms of what resource? I, I mean, I'm not sure what, how you would um, ask and or gather that information through focus groups. I'm guessing uh, some sort of direct. Uh, gathering for qualitative um, data? That's a very good question. It's something we've been thinking about also is not oversaturating communities and burdening communities as we're trying to better understand the issue or the root of the issue that will inform the proposals. Uh, so that will be a process that we will explore and think about as we move forward with the budget equity tool um, and think about uh, perhaps uh, some level of coordination, alignment, communication that can happen internally so we're not all burdening or going to the same communities, to those same places to access information. How do we do it in a thoughtful and strategic way that can inform um, our, our proposals moving forward, uh, but it will yield uh, rich data that is, is truly reflective of the needs of the communities. Um, thank you. You know, I'm going to speak from what I know, and what I know is um, uh, this: the city of San Jose, um, and the the last six years I've been serving there. Um, and one of the things that we we um, the lesson, one of the lessons that were learned is that we didn't have the mechanisms to gather the data, the right kind of data, right? Um, and then we didn't have um, the professional uh, development or training available for our um, directors um, in order to lead all of this uh, um, in, in, a different, in a different way. And so a lot of what we were doing was just really establishing ourselves, right? It's trying to identify what kind of data we actually needed to, how can we standardize, uh, um, how can we have the baseline, um, uh, and how can we not only have a a top-down down approach for, for equity because it's easy for some of the directors and uh, you know, uh, deputy um, 
executive director, all of all of the folks up in the uh, the upper division, <laughs> um, seniors. Um, I feel like you know, there's the frontline folks are are the freshmen, and um, and even though the, I well, that, that's a wrong analogy, and I'm I'm not going to take the time to think of something else because I was going to think about something sporty, um, but. For efficiency's sake, I'm just going to leave it alone. <laughs> Susan is going to appreciate me doing that. Anyways, the direct staff actually has a hands-on um, learning. Um, and the, some of that information doesn't get to our direct staff, even though they might be, ba you know, some of that interaction is, is already based on equity and honoring our community in a way um, that already uh, acknowledges race and some of the structural um, racism that we have built into some of the practices and trying to undo those, right? Um, and so a lot of um, anti-racist uh, strategies. But the, I see the, the, the body of the policymakers and then the organization are in two different tracks and, and how, how do we bring those together and so some of my suggestions were from earlier um, to integrate uh, equity into our core values, right? And then to also integrate um, equity into, and I'm moving away from asking you about uh, the, the data uh, because you, you answered it and we're, I'm just gonna leave it where it is. And then um, the, the second suggestion was to really um, operationalize these, our priorities with equ an anchoring equity. So making sure that the legislative files have an overlay of an equity lens. Is that something that you would be able to, to do um, is, and have an analysis of maybe the le legislative um, files so that not only for staff, but also for policymakers, so on the referral, side as well, and this is not something I mentioned earlier, but I think it would be fair that if we overlay uh, an equity lens for the legislative files, that we also do that for our referrals so that we also speak the same language. So I'm just checking in with you. Yeah, no, thank you for your question, Supervisor. I think first we really need to deconstruct and what an equity lens means. Um, and, and normalize that. Uh, so we have a shared understanding at the root operationalizing an equity lens is really looking at the data, mm -hmm. both qualitative and quantitatively, and engaging those communities that are gonna be most impacted by said issue at the, at the very root of that simpl oversimplification. So just having a, uh, understanding what it means to apply that lens and how that shows up. In a budget equity tool, these three questions are an opportunity to apply that lens to mm -hmm. a budget process. Um, and in terms of the opportunity to apply that lens to referrals or other examples, that it's something that um, I can explore and think about further. Uh, but at the root of that, I think it's just the role of this Office of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging is to support departments across this county in operationalizing an equity lens, deconstructing what that means and the importance of starting with a, a shared understanding and conversations, because it's not enough to have a conversation and go through a training, but then right. how are you gonna bridge that and operationalize that in day-to-day -day operations, the way we do business, the way we make decisions, right. whether they're programmatic or budgetary or otherwise. A great, great segue into what I was gonna ask you next, and that is how do we get, um, uh, because we're asking this of the whole organization, how do we as policymakers also, um, and this is not a question that I, I want my colleagues to, I want my colleagues to answer, I don't expect you to, to answer Anna Lilia, um, cause that's unfair, but I think that we also need to take a look at how we are trained and how we are creating a baseline um, uh, uh, from a set of trainings. I don't think it's enough just to have one gear orientation or a handout and then um, believe that you've captured a, a very complex um, concept that is also um, creating tension, not only in our systems, but across our nation and across all kinds of cities. And it's um, a continued um, learning that we have to have. And so I'm hoping that <coughs> As, as a body, a uh, policymakers, that we 
hopefully establish a series that we can um, continue to have. Um, this is something that I push for in the city because we, we had 10 people and, and it was very difficult to have a conversation um, that had a common understanding of what equity was. We hadn't defined equity and we would always say, you know, well, you're talking about equality <laughs> and I'm talking about equity and you're not comfortable with race and or maybe I'm not comfortable with race and we all have a, a different um, learning style and different pace of learning. But I, I think it's important as policymakers, especially if we um, hope to um, have long-term generational change for through our county services um, and the safety net that, that, that you all have been leading that I just jumped into, that we would honor that with some rich discussions and um, potentially uncomfortable discussions, but um, discussions that will allow us to, to grow. And so I'm hoping that we can also take a look at that and see what my colleagues think of a series that would involve all five of us in a public setting where we would talk about equity and how we are integrating that into our priorities or what that really means. Um, I am not I'm not Anna Lilia, but Anna Lilia would tell us how to do this um, and how to carry out these kinds of trainings for policymakers. And so, anyways, I'm, I'm hoping to hear from from uh, um, my colleagues around that. Thank you, Thank Supervisor Arenas. Um, I will look to colleagues. I'm also going to do a, a time check. I had promised um, that we will be out at five. It's 4:32, um, so I am looking to hear any final comments on this item. As I noted, I'm gonna take another public comment session and then offer um, a motion, which doesn't include new work, perhaps just a reorganization of existing uh, work, and then, um, and then we can go on with our days. So, Supervisor Chavez. You know, um, first of all, I, I really appreciated the exchange, and um, I, one thing that I, I, I was thinking about that was missing is even how under some circumstances, the disadvantaged group is very different. And I was mindful that there was not a mention of women. And one reason I wanna lift this up, colleagues, is that you know, prior to 2000, I don't know, maybe 13, a county of our size was spending less than a million dollars on services related to domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking on the service side. And I, you know, I, I don't I don't think that's because we had people here who weren't thinking about thinking about it. I do think there though that the struggle to get that that um, the, the money invested, the the time, and all of that is a reflection of how we don't always know when we are and aren't prioritizing things and why. And um, and I I could give you a couple of examples, but. But all that is to say that I am very interested in understanding even how that, that what, what's the trigger that helps us understand that. And I think the point that um, uh, Supervisor Arenas just raised about why community input is so important, I think there are a lot of women who have, who have testified before this board who have pretty strong opinions about why they think it took so long. And, you know, and so anyway, I, I say all that because I'm, I'm sure that's true in many instances in different ways. Um, and so I really want to re-emphasize the importance of making sure that as we're thinking about community engagement, that we're thinking about it perhaps in ways that seem, um, that may not be obvious to us that we're really going to have to listen to folks. And I was even thinking about that as it relates to children. So anyway, just not to make it more complicated. Thank you for all your good work that you're gonna do. It's gonna be super complicated. But thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Simidian or Supervisor Lee, anything to add? I'll pass, but uh, please understand it's just indifference to the hour, not a lack of engagement or interest. 
Thank you. <clears throat> one, one thing I just want to add, I think it's obvious for those who's in this area by equity is equity is not the same as equality. And I think that's something that's been so messed up in explaining what that means. And we can go on and on, and, but those of us understand what that is. I just want to make sure that's also the thinking cap that we have when we think about is providing just the facial equality does not mean equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ana Lilia and Tony, and again, um, thank you, Megan, really to uh, all of the, the staff. A lot of work, I'm aware, goes in um, before and during the, the meetings in order to provide us a venue for discussion, and I'm very, very much appreciative. Um, I'm going to offer uh, a couple of, of final comments uh, and a motion, and, and we'll hope for a second. Um, First, uh, regarding the responses to uh, bird board referrals uh, and to move forward in an attempt to streamline this set of requests, I'd like to suggest, not making this part a motion, but just a suggestion of a homework assignment to each of my colleagues to carefully review uh, your requests on the, uh, your items on the referral matrix, uh, flag any items that, that may lo no longer be relevant and, and you're willing to delete, to rank the outstanding remaining items, and if you can, identify to which current board priority they're best aligned. And if each of you could share that information with the county executive uh, by the end of the month, then I can, then that will lead to my motion, which is um, to ask, I would like to make a motion that the CEO bring back a streamlined and organized matrix uh, to the board, um, ideally at the March meeting. Uh, additionally, in circling back to the early, earlier question about operationalizing and prioritizing equity, I would add to the motion direction that the CEO add equity to the list of county values and that the priorities in slide five uh, specifically name equity, partnerships, communication, and the business operations of the organization as integral to those priorities. And finally, I'd like the CEO to bring back to the board, again, ideally in March, um, a more detailed priorities document that lists under each of those priorities what you anticipate to be accomplished in the next two years with some metrics uh, for the board to follow. And to be clear, I am not asking for additional work to be done just for work that is already in the queue um, that you can tie to the state of to the state of priorities is categorized and sunshined in a way that the board can monitor progress. If if that's clear, I'm getting a nod. Then I'll ask for a second. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. I'll be happy to make up a list for James to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any discussion on this item? Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to encourage that we use the language around transparency in this. And I, I just think from a, a transparency and accountability in part because it speaks to a lot of different parts of the organization. Absolutely. If that could be a friendly can, I moment will in a I'm happy second. to include. Um, and then, uh, then the other thing I just um, wanted to say, Susan, thank you for the organizing this. I think it's really important. I, I think as it relates to the work product, asking the staff relative to the um, to the referrals, I, I do think that one thing that I would like to see back prior to March is the new referral guidelines that we discussed today. And I think they do need to be broken up into, um, for lack of a better word, sort of a broad set of agreements between the staff and the board. Because I, I think that, I think otherwise we're gonna, we're gonna really be back in this same situation by budget time. That's an excellent suggestion, and I, and I would be glad to include that in the motion, as well as an incorporation of the suggestions that were made by supervisors as to what would be helpful for us from, from staff to be able to improve the process. And perhaps at, when that comes back to the board, if that could come back before that March time frame, because I, I do think that, that we're gonna have to start implementing that sure. the practices on all parts. Um, and as it relates to that particular document about previewing um, our referrals with staff, which my office actually has a practice of doing that now, um, the one caution I would make to the staff is that we have done that on occasion, getting something different than what we, what 
like actually literally different policy than was requested and and different so i would just say that we also have to just be mindful that the the preview and the review is to get feedback and that that should again be done collaboratively and timely um, because we've also had that challenge when we've given materials to staff thank you thank you all right i see no i see a red light just a quick question to, to clarify i thought i heard you distinguish between the first part which was an exhortation to your colleagues at, and that was distinguished from an actual motion slash direction to staff. Did I get that right? You got that right, Supervisor thank Sumitian. Thank but you. if you'd like me to add that to the oh, motion. Oh, no, I'm, I'm good to go just the way it is, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you for that. All right, taking yes for an answer. All right, let's take, oh, Supervisor Aranis. Um, thank you, I, I believe you captured everything that I suggested. It, um, the only thing is the, the last uh, piece, which is um, having the office of, I'm gonna get it wrong. Oh, Diversity, Dad? equity, and belonging. Diversity, inclusion, know, and beyond. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna uh, <laughs> office um, that, um, I'm gonna get it right. It's diversity, equity, and belonging. Oh, Deb. Uh, to formulate some kind of, um, uh, I don't know if I wanna say training, but um, conversation and maybe, um, uh, public meetings that we can, uh, as a policymakers, be involved and in, discuss equity um, for the sake of, of having a common understanding and applying those principles to the work that we're doing. With, with your indulgence, I'd like to um, vet that and talk through that a little bit more, and not include it in the in the motion today, because I, I think it's a little bit a little bit separate, and I would love to talk with you about the best way to approach that. Okay, um, well, I'll, I ask is that if we don't have a common understanding, I don't know how we would do the rest of the work. I don't know what the point is of having uh, a change in the core values if we don't have a common understanding. We can certainly schedule that conversation into a meeting. I'm, uh, what, where I was holding is on the, the suggestion of setting up a, a series of, of conversations, which I'm not prepared to add to the motion right now, but I, I hear you and I uh, agree with I the importance. I would leave it open to administration and, and, or staff to decide what it, how that would look like. I'm just saying it can't be a one conversation, a one and done. I, that's, that wouldn't be an expectation, but thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I will include the direction for recommendations from administration. Can I just follow up on that, Supervisor? Sure. Just because I want to make sure this is that I'm clear on this, um, Supervisor, you were asking for community outreach or for, or for the board to have a discussion and then to come up with a a work plan that that could be discussed with the full board and with staff. Well, I, I had asked for that feedback from um, uh, stakeholders. Uh, in relation to the budget equity tool because that's part of the process and that was um, question number three. Um, and what I understood from Ana Lilia is that um, they're gonna honor past input from stakeholders and, and have that as a baseline. I don't know what the next step is and I would expect that we wouldn't um, gather input traditionally this way and that we would have a more interactive uh, feedback loop with um, our stakeholders. Um, I don't want to impose a whole uh, outreach plan for for our community if that's something that um, administration or the um, the office isn't prepared to do at this point. Being that this is kind of the the first year, um, so I think creating that baseline for the first year I think is acceptable. Um, if we're sourcing some good data, and I'm trusting that they're gonna define what that data is and we don't have time to actually discuss it. Um, but I think we could provide um, direction for the following year um, or the following step. So I, if I could, I wanna just decouple the, because I think the, previously um, you made another comment just about the board's understanding of this. Right, those are so two I, separate things. Yeah, right. so I wanna decouple them for a moment and ask, I, I think you all come through Children's Family Seniors Committee is that correct? 
Yes, okay, Greta, thank you. Um, I apologize, without my glasses, if you were nodding, I didn't see it, so I apologize. Okay, <laughs> better. Um, what I, what we can do, um, what I will recommend is that when this comes back to the committee, that we have a more robust discussion about exactly what you're talking about, so that we have an understanding of what, what that baseline means, what would the next phases of outreach be, because I, I feel like we need to dive into that a bit more, because I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I'd like to, better understand kind of where the staff is in, in process, which is partly why I was asking a little bit about the tool, but but why don't, we'll, we'll agendize it for committee if that's comfortable with everybody as a next step. Yeah, that makes okay. sense, and I think that would be helpful because I was just gonna say one thing which, um, and Annalena, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think partly what is complex about this is for different, when we're talking about budget, different budget requests, the community of input would be different. So I'll just give a concrete example. If the probation department is saying we need more resources because kids in custody are giving feedback that they want access to this sort of programming, that would be the community feedback loop for that specific budget request. Of course, for other budget requests, it would be a much more robust and broad sweeping community input pro product that would be pertinent. And I think that's the kind of thing that we might be able to flesh out in that. Um, right, and it may discussion. actually even be a precursor to that which is just the basics under what terms and conditions, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's, that's what I don't understand and why I think it would be good if we just put it in committee and kind of drill down. Perfect. All right, great. And Thank so you. if that can be part of the motion that it goes to our committee, it would be great. Happy to send it to your committee. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to take a vote and then I'm gonna ask everyone to hang on uh, respectfully for the final public comment and then we'll adjourn. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. The vote passes unanimously, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, speakers in person or on uh, we Zoom? We do, we have one speaker in person and one virtually. Okay, let's have the person in in-person person, person uh, okay. first for two minutes, please. All right, perfect, thank we'll you. set the timer up right now. Paul Soto, if you can come. You will have two minutes to speak and the timer will begin once you begin speaking. Accommodation, uh, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg, I didn't want to think that this conversation could be had without the public input. Also, I want to extend my gratitude to uh, Supervisor Arenas. Um, exactly what it is that we voted you in to do, um, you displayed that today. So I just want to say thank you. Um, the Chicano movement, the lowrider movement, and the farm workers movement, we have a copious amount of body of evidence as to why equity is so important. Because the Chicano movement, the lowrider movement, and the farm workers movement was the response to the inequity by which the Chicano community specifically was experiencing. Not the immigrant community, but the Chicano community. Am I not confronted daily with the, with the fact and the reality that the United States government and the Santa Clara County and the city of San Jose deprived me of something private that I had a constitutionally protected right to possess? Is this not violence towards the tens of thousands of Chicanos who grew up not speaking Spanish because it was a, it was a common practice to beat the children inside the schools for speaking Spanish and teaching them that it was a humiliating, uh, shameful thing to be Mexican in Santa Clara County? Stripping him of an, where is my just compensation for taking something as fundamental as language from the Chicano? San Jose redlined the Mexicans, stripping him of ancestral wealth. Chicanos of my generation were burglarized, robbed, using force of law and the fear of the policeman's club from wealth we normally would inherit had the Chicanos' right to private property been respected. Does not the Chicanos of my generation deserve equal protection under the law, due process as we address these historical injustices? It is my conclusion and contention that the greatest act of violence against the people is to deny us our humanity and you deny us our humanity when you deny us our history. Thank you. Our next speaker virtually will be B. Beekman. B. Beekman, you will have two minutes to speak and the timer will begin once you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, also very much of a thank you to Supervisor Ellenberg for offering public comment uh, both at the beginning and the end of a meeting, this sort of meeting. It's really helpful, uh, really smart of you guys to do that. Thank you. 
Uh, I would like to, I guess, first thank uh, the words of Paul Soto today. His first public comment words about digital equity issues uh, I felt were really important. Uh, as the conversation went on this afternoon, uh, new Supervisor Arenas uh, just did amazing to talk about how to really bring into focus the new concepts of, of equity. And to possibly tie that into the words of uh, Dr. Smith, is there a way to bring uh, her words? Uh, you know, you, you, you figured out plans right now, but I, I'm hoping from those plans that there can be a very open way to look at, you know, uh, what exactly I can understand about equity at this time. And what, what will be, you know, key words and phrases to understand what will be the tools you'll be using to measure equity with, with now council first, uh, supervisor Arenas now on the, uh, on the uh, county board. I, I, good luck to yourselves to really find those words and, and to make, that, make those guidelines that are open and accountable to the public. Uh, Supervisor Chavez offered some really nice words that we have to be, from all of this work, uh, good luck at how this will be addressing the public and, and to include the public uh, in, in your practices. Uh, you know, that's how you build the, your better practices in the end. You have to do some internal work. Uh, good luck on the future of consent calendar items and such. Uh, but from that, really look for advice from the public and, and uh, seek it out and make it a part of the process, as you mentioned very nicely at the end today. And uh, yeah, just don't worry about uh, budget issues, I hope. Really allow hybrid meetings to continue. I think it's important. We can work through the budget concerns and, and things I've mentioned, we all mentioned earlier. We're all concerned about. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much, and that includes uh, what I found and hope you agree to have been several hours of really fascinating and growthful conversation. So thank, thank you to my colleagues, thank you to administration, clerks, and all of the staff that helped prepare us for today. Thank you, Madam President. And let the record show that we finished before five. It's 4.56. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> The meetings can go longer after daylight savings time. That's right. <laughs> Often, thank you to our security and sheriffs. I'm sorry, I meant to call you guys out also, but thank you.